books, you know, twelve volumes, nine volumes, eight volumes, seven volumes. These can become the source books for the smaller uh, histories because they can't reinvent the wheel, you know. So I think one of our, uh, I think uh, inadequacies has been that when you, uh, you know, publish this great book, uh, series of books rather, we haven't engaged with it. The historical community in India hasn't engaged with the VIF series, if I'm not mistaken, properly. So yeah. maybe that is something that yeah. is waiting to happen. And then on the other hand, uh, I'm also very happy to welcome Professor Sharadindu Mukherjee, the lone voice for so many years, you know, championing uh, a particular position which was not popular in the toxic history wars, if you want to call it that. And uh, once again, you see that he's going to talk about a specific issue, which is, of course, the CAA, the Citizenship Amendment Act of 2019. So from there, again, we're going to go to a, a, a bigger uh, a survey of a bigger project, which is also linked to your own uh, work, Professor Chakravarti. You've already published eight volumes, I believe, uh, of that uh, quite a big project yeah, it is. So I think I think this is a wonderful session and I invite you to please share it, Professor Chakravarti. I believe you and Professor Mukherjee were neighbors. All of you know each other. So I hand Very it over well. to you. Who will start? Dilip Dai will start, of course. Yeah. Mute. Can't hear you, Dada. Yeah. It all right now? Yes. Yes. Ah, thank you. Yeah. So, sorry, Jinju. Uh, Hello, sir. Hello, Dilip. You are a, a well-known person, so I should not stand between you and the listeners. So why don't you begin? Thanks, uh, Dilip. Da. It's uh, I'm privileged to have Dilip da sharing my session. Now, to talk about Citizenship Amendment Act from the Advanced Studies Institute in Shimla itself is a news, is a story. This would not be possible before 2014. And uh, this is a sea change which has taken place. I must admit that I have acknowledged that in my book also. Now, Dilipda, of course, uh, a different field altogether. Ancient history, prehistory, archaeology. I am absolutely modern India, contemporary India. But despite that, uh, I'm a little familiar with uh, Dilibda's work, enormous. Even I have read through all the papers, your paper and Professor Raghotam's paper also uh, yesterday. But one thing I remember with Dilibda was that we had neighbors in Delhi, that he was always very straightforward, known for his principle, honesty, and he's very fearless. Somehow that was the meeting point. And he had tremendous, much senior to me, but he looked upon me as a younger colleague. I'm grateful for all the support that you gave me. Now, why I just started talking about this uh, book of mine. Makranji just asked me, this is a book just came a few days back. Now, basically, uh, my field, my initial research was on peasants in colonial India, Bihar 1930s. And Dilip Dao will know what kind of problem I had to face in Delhi University when my thesis was being sent for to the examiners. It's a different story, but part of the struggle uh, which have been part of my <laughs> existence as a uh, sort of student scholar of history. Then I, uh, then I gradually got interested uh, 
in the condition of minorities in Pakistan and Bangladesh. So when I started writing uh, in the newspapers, 90, my first piece on the Bangladesh minorities, they put it Hindus, was in Pioneer, December 91, just 30 years back. One gentleman, Sunil Adam, I didn't know him. And by the way, Sunil Mehta, this, uh, he was editor of Pioneer, a known leftist, known rabid. And he published over the next four or five years, more than 60 of my articles. And one third of the articles were in foreign policy, rest of them were condition of Pakistan, Pakistan politics, Bangladesh. Team. I must admit that he never removed a single word from what I wrote. It used to be either 850 words article or 1000. That man who was known as a rabid leftist, pro Pakistani, he never removed a single word from my piece. Anyway, if I tell more, then it will uh, be a big scandal for so many people. I don't want to talk about this, you know. I never got any support from any quarter. And every time you write something on Pakistani state, I got published in Times of India. You know, those days, I will pick up the phone, talk to the editor, argue with him, fight with him, why don't you write? So they will publish. Even Times of India, people were horrified to find how come you get published in Times of India on Pakistan, Bangladesh. I did that. I wrote on Telegraph, Calcutta, Indian Express, Hindus at Times, except states when I wrote in all the newspapers. And that gave me a lot of fame or <laughs> Uh, good reputation. In fact, when 1998, uh, uh, BJP was launching its first website. First website, Vijay Mishra was the uh, number three man in government. He personally rang me up. I knew him because I was writing for Kisa Charanu. Please do our piece for foreign policy. I said, sir, I am a modern student of modern history. I write on different things. You have to write. So I did that piece. Okay. So I was writing on this aspect, my condition of minorities in Pakistan and Bangladesh. Then I did a book on Chittagong Hill Tract, Subject Citizens Refugees 2000. I, as I was telling Makranji and friends that I got the idea of doing a book when I had a fellowship in England, 93. And I used to visit Oxford, the Queen Elizabeth Center, the Refugee Studies Program, the iconic scholar, Barbara Harrell Bond. She was very kind to me. He, when she found that I have interest, so why don't you come and stay for a few days in Oxford and take a look at the archives, you know? And there I found my God. All the is a I hit the jackpot virtually. All the documents I needed was there, and few things I got in British Museum, public record of and things like that, you know. So last session when Dilip was uh, speaking, one of the questions was on if people don't look up the sources. Point is the sources are there, archival sources are there, books are there. Public, but people would not write on this because this is considered a very dangerous no go zone. Don't write on these things. This is a message we got from our undergraduate days, 18, age of 17, 18, who joined the college. So you should not talk about these things. And I was warned by my seniors, my teachers, that's fine. That's part of our struggle. Then I did a book on the Bangladesh uh, minorities in 2013. India Policy Foundation, they published. They found it good. They also brought out a Hindu translation. Then uh, last year, when the anti CA agitation started, I thought, why not write a full length book on that? Because uh, Keeping track of the newspapers, I said lots of article almost every day, every second day, all newspapers anti C agitation. And funny thing is this: some of the writers, those who opposed, they were refugees from either Punjab or Bengal. This is a very funny thing. You know, KPS Gill, the iconic IPS officer, was very friendly with him, very kind of him. He became very friendly. He will tell Sharadin, how come you know that some of the biggest pro Pakistanis and pro Bangladeshi are refugees from Bengal? And Punjab. He was also refugee from Punjab. Anyway, so I started writing. The pandemic had started. So I knew from the beginning that I would not be able to get go to the archives or Teen Murthy. But fortunately, because I was working on these things, I had all the data with me, including 
materials that got from public record of his Kew Gardens, some uh, Manchester, John the Islands, all over University of Hull, wherever I've been visited as a scholar, whatever, uh, all those documents are sometimes used, most of the time they are not used. So I got an opportunity to use them. And books and journals are no problem. Being a member of the ICHR, my ICHR library is very good. ICSR also very good. They will send me the documents online. So I had the stuff with me. Only problem was that I could not call my research assistants whom I could employ. Normally do employ, give them some money. They do the basic integrity. They could not do. Yet I finished the book in 10 months time. Okay. Now, now I think every scholar uh, has some experience like this. Now, the coming to the book proper. Makranji, you remi remind me 10 minutes earlier when I have to finish because the long story is a tragic story, is a story of defeat and disaster. Because we, as a people, refuse to learn from our history. And we Dilipta, are very good at Dilipta it. Dilipta will remind you, historians. not me. Dilipta will remind you, sir. Ha, please. The chair. <laughs> I sure, both. I had Dilipta. Uh, so 10 minutes earlier, at least, because the long story. And I, I can't sum up my whole book, but also I just try to find out certain important issues. This is called the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019. But this is not a book about the evolution of Indian citizenship or the regulations associated with that. I'm not going into that. I'm going into the question why it was introduced, who are the recipients, who are the beneficiaries, to uh, make it clear especially the younger crowd, maybe all of you know by now, that only victims of religious persecution, they name them Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, Christians, Jains, and Parsis, who have taken shelter in India up to 31st December 2014 from three countries, three Islamic countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, they will, be, they will be conferred citizenship of India. That's the thing. Two line act. So there's no question of going back to the history of citizenship. We cannot compare our citizenship law with Nepal or America because they didn't get the refugees because America was not partitioned. England was not partitioned. And the story, uh, the starting point, one important milestone will be partition. But again, uh, that is uh, important, but that is not the only important starting point. So, uh, my starting point is this. I'll begin like this. Is, is as I told you, very, very complicated, very, very uh, not complicated, very long story actually. Basically, this origin of this problem. Why Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, Christians, Jains, Parsis became refugees, have to leave their hearth and home in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Now, Afghanistan is a small problem. Afghanistan was not part of what you call British India. Afghanistan made part of Hindu culture, Tilda will know, has written on it thousands of years back. So it was mainly Pakistan, Bangladesh. And they were created, as you know, out of British India. In 1947. The two key concepts which uh, offer the key to this story I'm going to discuss. This is religious demography, imbalance in religious demography, and secondly, the concept of majority minority. The Religious demography, put it very simply, plainly, it's a point that wherever Hindus are reduced to a minority status vis-a-vis -vis the Muslims, Hindus have no future. They have to live. Either they convert or they abandon. And where do they go? Except the handful who could migrate to Canada or America or England, bulk of them would come over to India. So they are Hindus from Western Punjab, Sindh, Balochistan, Northwest Punjab province, or Eastern Bengal, what is now, could become East Pakistan and then Bangladesh after 71. Out of this, most of the refugees come from East Pakistan, now Bangladesh. Now, basis of this, why? So, 
next question is the concept of majority and minority from early 20th century when the modern politics is shaping up congress was set up in 1885 muslim league was set up in dhaka in 1906 the muslim league gave the idea main proponents that minorities means muslim minorities protection in hindu majority areas so there's a demand for weight wage voting rights disproportionate to their number their representation government jobs and various government schemes like that so their stand was that in case and they could see that india will be independent one time congress will come to power for congress nationalist same so they said congress is a hindu party basically and this is a line which the separatists had taken from sir sayad Ahmad's time very unfortunate that one historian who wrote the book of makers of modern india i should not re name him where he had named jinnah and sir sayad Ahmad's makers of modern india bunkim and subhash chandra bose are not there but jinnah is called a maker of modern india and he has a very big chapter in the class 12 history book that is still taught in india the initiative book i would not name him you can probably guess him so these are the two concepts from this we come to the causes of partition now cause of partition has been sought to be explained now cutting across all the political parties not much difference firstly blame british British are responsible for dividing our people and then ruling us. I strongly denounce this allegation. I remember Dilip that talking about the some of the British historians who wrote very important books on Indian history and did a good job. All the British scholars of Indian history were not devious people. He named Elphinstone, except Mill. He praised Elphinstone. Similarly, I know, let's admit, let's admit 72 years of independence, there are real divisions between Hindus and Muslims. No matter what you say, whether it's fashionable to say or not, I would not say that. Most of you would not accept that. Now, and this was not created by the British. British came very late. 1757, the first empire, Bengal, and we didn't say about by 1843, Sindh, 49 Punjab, and 56 Awad, they had controlled what was British India. Maratha has been already humbled by 1818. So division was already there. Destruction of temples, Hindu temples, conversion already started. Demography shift had already taken place. With the result, when the first census was carried out in 1881, it was found that certain areas in northwest of India, Balochistan, northwest frontier province, West Punjab, Sindh, except Punjab, of course, Hindu Sikhs were little about say roughly 40% so. Rest of the provinces, Hindu population had been reduced to so very small, 2%, 5% like that. So this is very important. And 1881, uh, first census Bengal, the Hindus had still slight age with the Muslims, 54%, 46%. So people, some people got the hint that this is a dangerous trend. People who have worked on the census operations, they know how it's created scare in Lahore, Punjab, when the first report came out. They thought a lot of people are converting to Christianity, Islam. So some people knew that this may have uh, some very unpleasant consequences. Except one, Dr. Mukherjee, who was a son-in-law of Sunanda Banerjee, iconic, the freedom fighter, the prophet of Indian nationalism. He wrote a book, Hindus are dying race. The rest of the society never took a serious note of it. And look, when the Pakistan demand was made, not say 1940 Lahore Resolution, March 1940, that Pakistan, that, that Muslim boy from Punjab, Rahmat Ali, the student in Cambridge, 
it is he gave the idea of pakistan p a k not i s t a n punjab afghan provinces northwest frontier sindh baluchistan punjab kashmir also he wanted fine pakistan without i and why he said that because he knew that this could be a nucleus of a another state federation away from india and if you read at the collected speeches of sir sayed ahmed you will see how he is uh, castigating congress congress is a hindu party is a bengali party and if these bengalis will come to power we don't accept that our friends pathans will come down the east and they will chop them off bengalis don't know they can hold pens they don't know how to fight all kinds of things so congress means nationalist means congress congress means bengalis bengalis means hindus and now this history is written documented you don't have to hide don't have to go to archives also just pick up a book from collected speeches of sir sayed ahmed he said that he again appealing to northwest pathans from northwest will come to khaibar pass and they will finish you off if you don't he called congress a civil war without arms now if congress leaders they have sir sayed ahmed as one of the leaders of india we can't help but unfortunately still those books are taught in india even in 2021 so this is uh, shocking this is surprising that muslim leaders i again say hats off to them they are visionaries in a real sense they could see they had perfect understanding of history which our leaders didn't have gandhi nehru even sir tagore a great admirer of tagore and tagore had a great sense of history he wrote so many things which our historians would not be able to write even essays not poetry and short stories fabulous essays he wrote on maharashtra shivaji hindu university swami sadanand he wrote something my god you can't think that tagore is writing on swami sadanand like this full of admiration even nehru wrote something very good about swami sadanand surprisingly tagore when he composed janagana mana punjab sindhu so sindhu is coming very high in his priority after punjab sindhu is coming but he didn't anticipate that sindhu will be out of india and that will become one important source of refugees after 30 years so tagore failed but very interesting uh, as a diary of sir cp scott cp scott was a famous uh, only pro british top level editor of a top great british newspaper called the manchester guardian the diary of sir cp scott is kept in john ryland's library in manchester so i mean as students of history all, all of us knew that sir cp scott was the top historian unlike say uh, daily mail or the times typical pro british tory newspapers guardian was soft to india so i i, I want to see uh, sir cp scott's diaries and there is an interesting <laughs> conversation tagore had with sir cp scott it's 1923 and sir cp scott writing my god this uh, i had a very frank discussion with uh, tagore and tagore said that some of the villages in bengal the population shift earlier the full of hindus but these days the population of muslims is increasing and i don't see hindus anymore he is writing that tagore so tagore had some sense of anticipation subhas Suppose only once. Now, Subhas Bose, like Gandhi, Nehru, uh, was also very secular. But yet, his only top leader who had criticized the Moplas genocide of Hindus in Kerala, the Moplas. We are celebrating the hundred years of that now. And Subhas Bose was just twenty-four at that time, younger to both Gandhi ji and Nehru. But his only man who is writing something about that. whereas nehru is aghast why my god the british have killed so many moplas <laughs> nehru doesn't write a word on the uh, sufferings of the genocide of the hindus thousands of hindus converted killed and of course gandhi ji was the man responsible for 
encouraging the moplas for the khilaf movement so i'm again not going to talk about gandhi you know so they didn't talk so subhas was some and once in 1938 he is uh, writing to governor bengal please don't make another sind out of bengal so he can see because sind had been separated from bombay presidency in 1936 a muslim in demanded a sind is a muslim major area so it should not be clubbed with so look muslim leaders were far sighted they could see that wherever they could dominate they should take it out from congress hindu control so subhas goes this true two references some hint among uh, the top intellectuals niraj chandra choudhury in his right autobiography that she asks two of his sisters 1920s that they should leave their home in east bengal uh, come over to calcutta west bengal one the sister said okay i am fine i don't see any problem another sister said no i can see some danger i will better shift so this is the thing you see this is incapacity i am very sorry to say hindus have been so creative such a genius but hindus have not read their history properly they cannot derive any lesson from history we have still shown our deficiency in that very unfortunate but is a fact okay i am coming back to those stories so this story of anticipation all these stories are there sind hindus being persecuted north west india happening every day north west nothing happening bengal also rights anti hindu rights started swadeshi movement onwards but people except few they could not see but there's stray reference to go talking to scott in manchester or london for half an hour subhas was making one statement in order to write one article not much but muslim leadership was very focused and they could see and so they capitalized on this word majority and minority and believe me you know all students of history no congress leader except hindu mahasabha it is fashionable to call it communal now took note of this that hindus what happens to hindus who will be left out in the muslim majority areas the way that the muslim people were asking do what has happened to the muslims in the hindu majority areas as post partition history shows what happens he now west bengal hindus are victims of you know islamic jihad last few months same thing happening punjab recently last month maler kotla was turned into a muslim majority district maler kotla is the only part of punjab where no exchange of population took place because of undertaking given by the sikh guru to the sikh so don't touch the muslims here so this is a problem so this is a short sightedness so my starting point uh, dilip dama ke bolben uh, just 10 minutes before when i have to end the starting point is the arab invasion of sindh this is the beginning of the problem this is beginning of de hinduization beginning of islamization and severe attack on their religion culture population so that should be the starting point if you are serious about understanding the underlying causes of the partition of india that's a big new problem and because of that rapidly in 1000 years the whole area contiguous areas northwest frontier baluchistan punjab west punjab they got almost depopulated finished similar thing started in bengal little late bakhtiar khilji 12 early 13th century 1206 or so again the process had started there now some people have tried to justify like american history eaten how islam spread there but we can take it very seriously point is islamization also started with the result this demographic scenario emerges by 1930s where one could see mark out areas in india where hindu are in a majority where they in a minority where muslims are in majority where hindus are minority things like that so map this demographic imbalance was very very conspicuous and muslim league leaders took maximum advantage of this which the congress did not do and so this is a failure so i will dismiss the theory that the british divided and ruled us and gandhi's very famous colleague khilafat movement mohammad ali said 
we divide and they rule. We are divided. His great friend Muhammad Ali, he said, what do you say, Gandhi ji? We divide and they rule. But we are not going to accept this because this goes against our commitment to Gandhian values. Whatever does it mean, I don't know. So we must blame. You see, Muslim League's agenda was known. Right from asking for separate electorate, Shimla deportation, not very far from where he was sitting, <laughs> Makranji, same building, Shimla delegation led by Aga Khan. They asked for separate electorate, weight wage. So that is a, these are important steps in the evolution of what we call separatist mindset. Every time they go, the British accept that. Our leaders keep quiet. They said, okay, okay, accept, accept that. Compromise, compromise. Let's accept. We are a majority. Let us be kind. Let us be good, nice, big brothers. And so a situation comes by 19. 30s, when Iqbal was talking, Lahore Session Muslim 1930, he said, fine, we have uh, a Northwest Federation in Northwest for the Muslim have a majority, Iqbal. And if it's a Pandit's book, Discord of India, my God, even after he had said, uh, Pandit Nehru had gone to meet Iqbal, and a long discussion, very nice, no hint of what, uh, what the implications, what Iqbal is doing. At the end of the say, he was very happy that Iqbal had told him, Jawahar, you are a patriot, Jinnah is a politician. He's happy with the certificate. And this is the problem of the Hindu society. They are always looking for certificate of good behavior from the Islamic Ummah. And this is reflected well in every aspect of our polity, education, foreign policy, even after 1947. There's the difference between, <coughs> sorry, Punjab partition and uh, Bengal partition. In Punjab, 1947, the Hindu Sikh population was roughly about 23%. Within two years, it was reduced to, now it is about 2%. 1% Christian, 1% Hindu Sikhs. In Bengal, 1947, Hindus were 99%. Now they are less than 80%. Mind you, both Punjab and Bengal had contributed maximum in, in terms of revolutionaries. Revolutionaries, freedom fighter, Maharashtra was very close. But maximum revolutionaries who went to incarcerated Andaman Nicobar, Mandalay, toughest prison sentence, maximum death sentence, Bengal Hindu refugees. And they are from East Bengal. What is now Bangladesh? How many of us have been told about them? No one. We don't. How many of us? I keep asking my students, even bigger audience, not here, of course, I'm surely no. It's a famous revolution called Tripura. Trulaka uh, Chakravarti, um, also called Maharaj, he spent 30 years in British jail. Kirish was in British jail. And he had the toughest of sentences, Mandalay. Who all went there? Lokmanar Tilak, Ajit Singh, Bhagat Singh's uncle, Subhash Chandra Bose, and Trulaka Chakravarti. Toughest. Pandit Nehru Gandhi went to very nice places, comfortable places. But not come to that. Andaman, next. Trail of the way to Andaman also. <clears throat> Andaman, Mandalay. And after partition, he didn't leave East Pakistan. He said, No, I'm born here, it's my land. He was imprisoned by the Pakistanis also, considered a Hindu agent. There's not a line on Triloka Chakraborty in any of her textbooks. Anyway, it's a very, very fascinating story, very tragic story. There's no time to talk about that. I mean, coming back to the original story, Punjab and Bengal partition. So Punjab, the Hindu Sikh population reduced from 29 23% to 2%. Bengal, it is a little slow is Bengal, gradually 29%, 47% to the over 8%. And this is exactly the term I have used in my book on Chitang Hill Tracks. In Punjab, Hindus and Sikhs were subject to what I call jhatka. In Bengal, they are subject to halal, slow slitting. And this is happening. Not a day passes. <coughs> Sorry. Many of our students are in different government departments, very senior positions now. We get a lot of in information what is happening actually. Not a day passes when a Hindu doesn't cross over from Bangladesh to India. Similar is a story from Pakistan to India also, Hindu Sikhs. So if a Hindu 
a Sikh officer is commissioned for the first time. Five years. For the first time, a Sikh was commissioned in Pakistan five years back. Before that, only till then, the last and first Hindu commissioned officer in Pakistan army was who later became Major General Siya Dato. I had met him at his cantonment house in Dhaka. 1949 recruitment to the Pakistani army. He was senior to General Irshad and he should have been army chief, but fine. So after that, no Hindu Sikh was recruited, commissioned in Pakistani army. But these are not stories in India. We are secular. We are land of Buddha and Gandhi. So easy escape route to uh, escape all important problems. So chori karo, that's all. So this is the national motto. Now this is the problem origin. So the the refugees keep coming. Now what happens to them? Some of them, those who came in 1947-50, some of them, many of them were given citizenship. But after that, many were not given citizenship. Where would they go? They are Indian citizens. Their fathers, grandfathers, grandmothers, they were born in on the Indian soil, part of British Empire. So this should be the responsibility of the Indian leadership, Indian society to take care of them. We didn't do it. It is very fashionable in our elite, quote unquote, I call them opportunist career circle to talk about the rights of Palestinian refugees. Fine, they have a problem. But what's the total number? Four million. And here you talk of crores, if the government doesn't know the number of refugees who are in India. Exact so figure is not known. Sorry, they do under yeah. 15 minutes. Another 15, oh, that's very kind of you, fine. Uh, so, now what to do about that? For 71, so major exodus of Punjab, as I said, got cleansed of the Hindu Sikh refugee in a year or two of partition. One Indian High Commissioner to uh, Pakistan, Sitaram, whose private papers I have got, the entire lot correspondence, the AME I have got with me. Uh, he was a little sympathetic to the Hindu Sikh refugees. He was immediately shunted by Nehru. And when the partition happened, naturally Hindus, many Hindus wanted the Muslim also should be packed off. But here our leaders, Gandhi, Nehru, they stood like rock, they said, no, we don't accept two nation theory. Why? Muslim League accept two nation theory. You can't do a thing about them. No one goes a fast against them. So we concede the demands. You let Hindus go to hell, die, converted, their women be picked up, forcibly married, nothing. You can't do because you do. So you pay the price. You make the society, Hindu society, Sikh society, Buddhist society, pay the price for it. But you get nothing in return for the Hindu society. So naturally, it's a very big demand that Hindus wanted that these people, uh, Muslims also, should go back. Now, this was stopped. Exchange of population idea, which Muslim League gave. Honestly, 1940s, you look at the resolution of Muslim League, the honest people, they told Jinnah to lots of times that we are different people, different nations. The fact is that Jinnah was a second generation Hindu. His grandfather was a Hindu. But it's Say we have different history. So Jina said, your heroes are our enemies. We don't interdine. We don't intermarry. So different histories. Now, this is largely true, but also falls to some extent. As in Jinnah's case, Iqbal's <laughs> came from Hindu family, Hindu Brahmin family, Kashmir. So some of the histories are wrong, but this mindset, Islamization, mindset, intolerance, got intertwined. This is what our leadership failed to understand. We are paying the price for that. Gradually, uh, Punjab refugees, Sikh refugees, most of them were settled, so well settled by early 50s. But Bengal refugee movement is slow, gradual, in stages. So after 1940s, but 1950s is a major problem, major problem. When anyway, Jayaprakash Narayan said that India must send his armed forces to Pakistan. So that Patel was on to do, do that, must teach Pakistan his lesson. But then Bengal had a leader like Shambhavakrishna Mukherjee, the last of the Mohicans, last of the genuine national leaders of India. 
as you know, had an unfortunate, tragic, mysterious death. And this Jansang political party was set up by Shahwasha uh, primarily to help the refugee cause. Hindus of Punjab and Bengal and then Kashmir, of course, the two main agenda of the Bharatiya Jansang. As long as there, he fought for it. And to look at the procedure, it was time to cite on that. I mean, such high quality debate, high quality debate, informed debate. Uh, and Shams Mukherjee is one of the very ablest spokesmen of that. Unfortunately, these are not taught. Very few books have published on Shams Mukherjee, except by Tathagat Rai. So it is this kind of hidden history we must bring out, highlight, and this must reflect textbooks. Unfortunately, textbooks have not been revised. And whatever I hear, Gravevine, is very disappointing. I must say, you see, I, I have always uh, spoken like this, written like this, for the emergency university department headed by R.S. Sharma, uh, first chairman of ICHR, I have always spoken like that, whether it is now. So you're always trying to hide certain unpleasant. So 50, then 64 again, major anti-Hindu riot, Narayan Ganj riot, as you call, 71, uh, Bangladesh War of Independence, about 10 million uh, refugees were driven out. Bangladesh official, official uh, estimate, 3 million people perished, killed. 90%, 95% of them are Hindus. 90% of the 10 million refugees who flooded, moved into India, they're Hindus. It's one of the biggest massacres of Hindus in 1971. We won, we defeated Pakistan, but we got nothing in return. No punishment, no penal action. The not put on oh, crimes tribunal for Pakistanis. Well, let off. Again, same policy. We should be very nice. We should be loyal to the Ummah, Islamic Ummah. We are a secular nation. We should be talking about Hindu rights. Let the peripheral groups, small groups, talk about that. So in course of time, the number of refugees kept increasing. Huge number. If you go to the borders, because since I was a student of it, I've been visiting borders, you know, and through my students and contacts, I have seen huge number persecuted, uh, emaciated, Traumatized, young girl taken up, abducted, family members killed. These people are coming over to India. And many of them came from very established, good families. You know. so, as I told you, you know, gave probably the maximum leaders of Free India. And Michael Mudushudam, Sir Jagadish Chandrabos, Bipin Chandrapal, name anyone, Anand Omaima, Justice Radha Binodpal, name anyone. Leave aside ICS and things like that. Iconic figures of Bengal Renaissance, Indian Renaissance are there from East Bengal. Dhaka, Mohammed Singh, Chotogram, Raj Shahi. What happened? So our society, our people were mute spectators, one of the biggest genocides in human history. And I think no nation had suffered so much the Hindus of Bengal. Sitram Goel, whom I consider as one of the iconic historians of our time. Sitaram Goyal would tell me that really, Jews had really some inkling that some disaster will fall upon them. Those who have read Hitler's Mein Kampf, isn't it? He, they could see that. And earlier also the Jews in uh, Europe had suffered. But it's, uh, the country which gave justice to Radha Binod, say justice, uh, say Radha Binod Pal, Bipin Chandra Pal, Sir Jagadish Chandra Bose, where Tagore wrote most of his essays and poems, he would just read through the letters of Tagore. What vivid descriptions of East Bengal boat journey. Niro Chodhi said, yes. Two minutes? Five minutes. Fine. Yeah. Believe that? Five minutes. Five minutes. minutes. Five minutes? Fine. I'll, 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 I told you it's a very tragic story, unending story, because as I talk to you, refugees are coming or some Hindus have been persecuted in Punjab and Bengal. So these, these people uh, need some action. Once they come over to India, having lost everything, they need this citizenship. It's a basic thing. And this is what 
the government led by our venerable prime minister narendra modi ji and his home minister amit shah ji has done you know so we have enough reasons to be grateful to these two iconic leaders of contemporary india who had this perfect sense understanding of history and given this given us this uh, act what does it mean just one line all those uh, hindus sikhs buddhists christians pastis jains who have crossed over pakistan and afghanistan up to 30th december 2014 they will be giving citizenship rights so it is as simple as that so i am very pained when people like amartya sen i have i have been writing about amartya sen at a long argument to amartya sen in 1993 in cambridge when he came to deliver the nehru memorial lecture i did a piece on pioneer on that day you know that's just a demolition he had not yet got the nobel prize but then you have been hearing that here is at the bengali gentleman you got a nobel prize i i i i blasted him for 10 minutes everyone was very appreciative but somebody a very senior professor who invited me say shardu kya kiya tum kabhi england mein aur visiting ke liye nahi aaoge i said bahut acha main naam nahi bolunga if you in case it all right he said tum wo kabhi koi nahi bulayega tha main theek hai bahut acha hai hamara kaam ho gaya so amartya sen to punjab as i said kps gil said why there is justice uh, sachar who gave the sachar commission report or kuldeep nayar khushwan singh except kps gil among the top leaders kps gil no one has talked about this thing simply no one in bengal bengal is famed for buddhism i don't know what kind of buddhism they have you know most of them are refugees from east pakistan if you press them beyond a point you'll find out that either his mother was raped or sister abducted and here they come and said what is this communal parties are doing in india the bengali culture is different we are different the way they say in up ganga jamuna tehzeeb aur punjabiyat are punjabiyat hai to partition kyu kiya bhaiya aur ganga jamuna tehzeeb hai sabse zyada mandir to up mein toda hai masjid bani hai ab bangal to bhai partition hua to region ke basis pe so you see so we go by this catch words given by uh, these uh, superficial intellectuals so we must get out of this this trap trap this uh, 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 wave of uh, nonsense and deception we must look at facts no problem sources are there lots of people who suffered in partition 1950 64 70 they are still very much with us fabulous fascinating source of oral history authentic story and all the documents are there in archives indian archives british archives ha huh. only problem people like me your book you won't be funded no matter who runs the government you won't get a fellowship in teen murthy if i write it in to talk to teen murthy and your book would not be reviewed make sure that your book will not be reviewed my book on chidam hill tax was reviewed only by desh you know which is a very secular <laughs> fortnightly from calcutta very prestigious excellent review except last line look sorindu has some hindutva influence but i took it as a compliment so if you are prepared to pay this much of price we can rectify but to produce textbooks makran ji we need approval of government unless government approves that we can't do it we can't change ba history program people are talking about that there's a difference to all together you know this is not the way i'll just end with this last one my father's generation <clears throat> so just 100 years back who went to christian run school in bihar british days uh they read a history book written by ramesh chandra dat the second batch of indians who get into ics iconic writers of the economic history of india twice president of congress now this congress is not this congress of course and that book his book history of india was written by people of my father's generation the british days height of british empire how did it begin mother and motherland says that poet are greater than heaven that is janane janma bhumi sh that famous thing even british would not stop this now i'm sure no textbook writer even 2021 will dare write this book immediately your own people will call are you are hindu to badi what do you say tumne hindu samajh ke theka le liya go ahead i'm sure i assure you nothing that's why textbooks have not been changed 2004 this government came they appointed a committee barunde committee they scrapped the books given by murli mohan joshi the different story that 
Murali Manohar Joshi has cracked my book on my manuscript on world history. It's a difference to a big story, equally scandalous story. 2005, these new books came out, and these books are there going strong in 2021. So this sums up the tragedy or what do you call first of higher education in India. And there the refugees suffered. I'm happy for the timing that the refugees, hapless people, they will get some assurance in citizenship and they can live safely. The livelihood, employment, security is a different matter altogether. Because lots of refugees in Bengal, West Bengal, have suffered in the anti-Hindu riots in Deganga and various canning in last 10, 15 years, ever since this government, Trinamool government had come. So Hindus continue to suffer and suffer, but find some rays of hope. Thank you so much, uh, Makranji, uh, Dilip Da on all friends. Lavanaji also, in fact, Lavanaji, I must thankful that when she wrote to me very nice, Ardhan, can you speak? I said, look, these are three, four things. And I said, look, my book has just come out, but no, no, he said, no, no, you speak on that. So, so insisted, so I'm speaking on that. Otherwise, I'll be speaking on something else probably. Sorry, Safer no. subject. Tagore on Sorry, Thank you so much. Sorry, yes. It has been a wonderful lecture. I have learned very much from Thank it. Thank you so much. And I've got a personal reason because born in 1941, I had to accompany my parents as a refugee from Bengal. So I very well understand mm -hmm. the things we are talking about. Uh, you see this act, whatever it is called, C triple A or double A. 2019, it was, badly, it, was badly, it was very much necessary because you divided yeah. the country in the name of religion. Yeah. Where will the Hindus go unless this country does not offer them protection? It's as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. Where That's would it. we have gone in 1947? So it's fairly straightforward. It has got nothing to do with secularism or whatever. Well, thank you very much. Now, thank somebody you. called somebody called Profundo Chakraborty has published a book. Yes, it's a very well researched Marginal. book. Marginal, very interesting, wonderful wow. book. A genuine contribution to the refugee literature in India. Well, thank you again, Sharadindo. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Dilip. It's a pleasure uh, to be with you again after many many years. Thank you, all of you. Sorry, Thank just God. one line I will take. I have Please. read the article uh, by uh, Philip Da also and also by Professor Gautam. In fact, in my book, I have referred to the correspondence ideas of uh, K. Munshi and Arshim Majumdar. So briefly, that is also there. That is an important starting point when you study history. You know. So I'm thankful that you again talked about that. I'm sure we'll expand, Professor Gautam will expand this point. There's a lot to learn and to rectify in case our government decides to scrap these old textbooks and bring new ones. Thank Thanks. you. Sorry, I've taken a lot of time. Venkat? Yeah. Your turn now. Please unmute yourself. Okay, am I audible now? Yes, please. Yeah. Good afternoon to uh, each one of you. And my thanks to Professor Dilip Chakravarti, Professor Mukherjee, and Professor Makran Paranjipai uh, for having me on this uh, very important panel. The topic that I have chosen is one that ties with the general theme of this webinar, that is the practice, theory, and methods of writing Indian history. So, uh, of course, I am uh, trained in which is the medieval history of India, and I chose uh, Vijayanagara history as my area of expertise. But I thought for this particular uh, event, um, an exposition on Vijayanagara history would hardly be suitable. And so I decided to look at one very iconic piece of 
historiography that post-independence India produced, and that is the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan series, which for some reason, and I will go um, into uh, depth in my paper, was deliberately neglected. You know, sometimes historical classics fall by the wayside out of benign neglect. We happen, you know, today nobody would read Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire to uh, get a handle on what happened in the fading years of the Roman Empire. That I would call benign neglect. But in the case of the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan, it was a sustained campaign to marginalize what was undoubtedly one of the best pieces, and I'm looking forward to the work uh, by Professor Dilip Chakravarti, uh, which uh, he referred to in his uh, the morning address, the Viveka Nanda Foundation of India series on the history of India. I must say, I have not, I'm not familiar with it, but I am sure that if it comes to my hand, I will, uh, I will deal with it in much the same way as I have critically examined the BVP series. You know, put it in context, take it, take out the good points and try to uh, measure it in terms of uh, historical theory, methodology and understanding. In the years immediately after the independence of India in 1947, a collective multi-volume history of India was published by the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan. The organization was headed by K.M. Munshi, Dr. K.M. Munshi, a minister in the cabinet of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. K.M. Munshi was a wonderful, a very tall leader. And uh, uh, he, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how one looks at it, uh, was the uh, head of the trust that launched the restoration of the Somnath Temple. And because of that, Nehru and K. Munshi had a falling out. Nehru, for some reason, thought that any restoration of a temple went against the secular ethos of a country. And the shadow of that very pernicious thought still lingers on today. It never came to Nehru's mind that the restoration of Somnath was indeed a restoration of the pride, the wounded pride of India. It never came to his mind. What was destroyed had to be left destroyed. That was the um, idea. And because of that, K.M. Munshi, who was the foot minister during uh, in, in the interim cabinet of Jawaharlal Nehru, was, uh, and he had a falling out. And, and it is incidentally over the temple issue that uh, uh, Professor that uh, Jawaharlal Nehru and Sardar Patel had some slight disagreement, which, uh, which of course, uh, was one of the factors that um, uh, that Patel wanted to discuss with um, Gandhi on the very day he was uh, shot. You know, on the day that Gandhi was shot, there was a meeting scheduled soon after the uh, the prayer meeting to uh, with Sardar Patel. That meeting did not happen, but on the agenda was this meeting of the meeting was this discussion of what uh, the way in which uh, uh, Sardar Patel was being treated by Jawaharlal Nehru. The purpose underlying the gigantic venture was to showcase the achievements of Indian historians who sought to publish a history of India on the same lines as other multi-volume histories such as the Cambridge Modern History. We all recognize the Cambridge Modern History was one of the uh, one of the first major uh, multi-volume histories um, uh, ever undertaken by Lord Acton. And this uh, multi-volume history called the Bharati Vidya Bhavan, or the history and culture of the Indian people, uh, sought to accomplish something similar. Spread over 11 volumes, the VVV series attempted a synthetic and comprehensive history of India from the earliest period till the transfer of power from the British to their nominated successors in the interim government. I've, I've chosen my words very carefully. I don't call it independence, though sometimes we slip into this idea that is independent. Only when India is reunified can we really speak in terms of independence. What we have was a transfer of power. It's a transfer of power from the British government to a nominated successor. And if you look at who was the first prime minister of India, historically, it would be uh, uh, Subhash Chandra Bose because he too set up a, 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 a legally accepted government which was internationally recognized during the time of war um, when he set up the interim government in, uh, in the Andaman. So if you have, and, and, it, and even that contributed a 
We have made a huge step towards liberation of India, um, as uh, Professor Basu um, uh, has pointed out uh, in the making of Asia, that without Subhash Chandra Bose's INA, today India would not be free. In fact, it's a huge step towards the freedom of India. And, and, and in the writing of history, the INA is not even a footnote we don't even give a footnote. It is as if only Gandhi, Nehru dominated the scene and, and India got its independence thanks to the efforts of these two. That is, to that extent, we have kind of devalued the history of our uh, land. And one of the things why, one of the reasons why contemporary historians have um, riled against uh, BVB series is because they attempt in their own way to set the record straight. So, uh, meticulously edited under uh, the uh, stewardship of Professor R. C. Majumdar, the doyen of Indian historians, the series represented canons of historical methodology. It, it combines, uh, you know, uh, numismatic, epigraphic, and literary sources. In fact, all the available sources that were available till the early part of the um, uh, early part of the um, uh, mid uh, 20th century were all uh, consulted in a very critical manner. You, you won't find uh, even a trace of what you can call uh, bad history in the PVB series. And yet, for some reason, uh, the historians, and I've chosen particularly the work of uh, our, um, Romila Thapar for some critical analysis, they, they consistently misrepresented this series as if it represented a communal version of history. And we'll come to that in a moment. Surprisingly, this splendid achievement became a victim of its own success in that it was relegated to obscurity as the tides of politics ebbed and flowed in the post Nehruvian dispensation. Why was the uh, BBB series neglected? Partly because its idea of nation, where the sovereignty of the indigenous people of India was recognized, went against the very grain of, um, the, of the idea of India uh, that Nehru and his Congress party um, uh, uh, was wedded to. And also the idea of partition, because we cannot look at modern India, as Professor Mukherjee has rightly pointed out, we cannot even begin to understand modern India without looking uh, and seeking the roots of partition. It is not uh, possible for us today to say that Jinnah was responsible for partition and make him uh, uh, um, solely responsible. Partition would not have happened without the complicity of the Congress. And somehow the writing of history that, that has been undertaken in the post-independence period tries to obscure the complicity of the Congress party in the whole run-up to the, uh, to the uh, partition. Without the Congress and its complicity, partition would not have happened. And I think that part has to be uh, understood. Another factor that contributed to the bloodshed of partition was to bring, da uh, bring up the date, bring, bring forward the date from 1948 to 1947 to suit the convenience of uh, Lord Mountbatten. And, and so partition was presented uh, to the people of India as a fiat accompli. And, and therefore, the, the, uh, the bloodshed that ensued as a consequence, as a consequence of this fiat accompli was indeed horrendous. And so we have to hold to some extent both the then British government, the interim, you know, of uh, the uh, British Viceroy and Governor General at that time, Lord Mountbatten, and the interim government that did not prepare for partition in a very systematic way, responsible for the bloodshed. And, and I think modern Indian historiography has danced around this particular aspect. And that is one of the reasons why the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan uh, series has been neglected. Uh, uh, in this paper, we examine a set of issues pertaining to the reception of the series. First, we study the, under, uh, the scheme of the entire series with a view to undercover, undercover, uh, uncovering the logic uh, behind the series. What was the logic? They said history and culture. That is such a complex entity as India has to be seen in terms of a kaleidoscope. 
of events, kaleidoscope of personalities, kaleidoscope of uh, cultures, and in uh, and in imbriated in that kaleidoscope, you also have a larger unity, and that larger unity is what we call uh, Bharatitya or Hindutva or whatever name we may give. There is uh, the, the multifarious dimensions to that kaleidoscope, but within that. Uh, in within that frame, you also have an overarching unity, and it is precisely that unity which the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan tried to capture in its own way. Today, we may have a more sophisticated understanding of that unity, but then we cannot decry the efforts of uh, this particular series because of our more sophisticated understanding today. Aspects of periodization which have remained contentious are uh, studied herein with the aim of explicating the overall schema. Uh, one of the uh, one of the things that that, that the uh, the opponents particularly pointed out is a political orientation. That political narrative was taken as the framework of the Bharatiya Vidya One. Sure, that uh, uh, chronology is the backbone of history, and chronology is essentially a part. Um, is determined by uh, uh, political events. So there is nothing wrong in using dynastic labels uh, uh, to, uh, to have a certain kind of periodization. And so Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan starts off with Vedic age, imperial unity, classical age, age of imperial Kanauj, then uh, struggle for empire, all of which dealing with one particular empire at each time uh, in a 200 or 300 year period. And then when it comes to the Delhi Sultanate and the Mughal Empire, they they focus on a theme that that I think we have uh, tried to, we have neglected over the last sixty or seventy years of independence. That is the resistance of the in, indigenous people to these invasions. When uh, what what uh, the that the fact that India consistently resisted the invaders. And, and because the Bharatiya Vidyanban series um, labels the uh, Turkish uh, rulers, and after the Turkish, it was the Mongol uh, Mughal rulers has um, invaders that the uh, that the leftist uh, cabal of historians started labeling them as communal. The indigenous people of India have their own history, and that has to be recognized when we look at India as a cultural or as a civilizational entity. And unfortunately, what these historians have done is to remove uh, the indigenous people of India and their history from the equation altogether and look at India as if it is only a subject of invasion and the theme of that of the, their history is the history of invasions just as it was in the case of the imperialist uh, imperialist historians like uh, like even Mill. So um, and that is the reason why they have been consistently opposed uh, to the Bharatiya Vidya Bhav series. Uh, uh, secondly, we examine the criticism leveled against this series by Romila Thapar, who in her various papers has accused the series of providing intellectual justification for Hindu communalism, as they call it, by invoking the historical past. In the now infamous pamphlet, Communalism and the Writing of History, the very important pamphlet that they brought, brought out in 1968, uh, where uh, Romila Thapar, Harmans Bhutia, and Bipan Chandra particularly singled out the uh, Bharati Vidya Bhavan for some vicious uh, analysis. Romila Thapar and her colleagues are at pains to delegitimize de the entire pre-independence achievement in, in Indian historiography on the grounds that it glorified the past. And absolutely, they have not been able to bring any evidence to bear that there's any kind of glorification. Does not address the issue of social and uh, economic change. In fact, at, in every volume you have uh, enough evidence to show that R.C. Majumdar and his colleagues were quite sensitive to the question of uh, economic and social changes and advancing the notions of Hindu identity politics. In fact, one, one of the criticism one, uh, one could have against the BVP series is that it does not give, up, give enough space for an indigenous articulation of historiography. Uh, because wherever you have, um, you know, a, a literary text, text that con uh, contradicts an epigraphical or material, they choose to go by epigraphy rather than the literary text. So they are, they are at no point in time do they make any uh, uh, do they give any concession to Hindu identity politics. Uh, that is a fact. And 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 there and there's one more test which is which uh, they, they, uh, which should 
in the whole Bharat, uh, you know, Babri Masjid, uh, uh, Ayodhya Temple. In fact, if you look at the chapter on Baba, the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan uh, series doesn't even mention the existence of the temple at Ayodhya. To that extent, they have been very sensitive to the uh, uh, to the other uh, point of view. And so, but and, and so, in what way can they call this Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan uh, communal um, when it does not, as I said, give any concession to Indian to Hindu identity politics? Beats me. Given the leftward drift in intellectual life in India, it is no wonder that the litany of criticism was not subjected to scrutiny or examined for its inherent validity in terms of valid uh, uh, principles of historiographical criticism. There's been no analysis. I think I, I'm probably the first historian to look at the series critically. What is the uh, principle on which um, uh, these uh, uh, it was attacked? what they call the, uh, the principle of presentism. That is to see the past in terms of the present and, and what was regarded as uh, 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 the presentist streak in the analysis against the BVB series was precisely what I started off by mentioning that, uh, the, uh, that it is a, 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 a way misreading of the whole project. A fact that is often ignored by historians is the late beginning of the historian's profession in India. The first postgraduate department of history was opened in India only after the end of World War I in 1919, to be precise. I think Calcutta University was the first university to have a postgraduate uh, department of history. The Imperial Records Office, which became the National Archives after 1947, opened its records for research only after independence. Remember that the, uh, that the public records office in England was open to research in 1863 itself. And there have been historians who consulted the records even before that. And here we had uh, the records were opened only after 1947, which shows that the whole profession of history began very late. Seen against the background of these facts, it is certainly very encouraging that soon after independence, such a stupendous task was undertaken and realized. It is worthwhile to recollect that none of the rival series of collective scholarship, which was meant to challenge the BVB series, have seen the right of, uh, light of day in their entirety. The flagship journal of the emerging profession of history, the Journal of Indian History, was founded in Allahabad in 1922, and in a, in a few years, it was shifted out. So it is less than 100 years. The profession of writing history is less than 100 years old. The intellectual context in which history as a discipline emerged in India was vastly different from Western Europe. In both England and France and perhaps elsewhere, the research into and the reconstruction of the national past went hand in hand with the assertion of popular sovereignty, which was now imagined itself as a nation. And I think this is an important point. When nations emerge, the sovereign, sovereign and the sovereignty shifted from the king to the people. So they, they started saying that it was the people who are sovereign. And how, how did this idea of the sovereignty of the people come into being? Because historians started writing the history of the nation. And so the nation became essentially uh, the repository of sovereignty. Has sovereignty came to be associated with and embodied in the will of the people as nation or nation, the state became the agency that sought to legitimize itself by appropriating the past and historians of life by casting the past as a prologue to the emergent nations. Therefore, the assertion of popular sovereignty and the deployment of history as a vehicle for its imagined continuity of the past was a powerful uh, intervention and made historiography a new and powerful tool of nationalism. Unfortunately, in India, this idea of a nation has been the repository of uh, sovereignty never quite uh, took hold. And this is one of the basic differences between how history uh, uh, was studied in the West and how it emerged in the West and the theoretical underpinnings of how history came to be written in India. A particular strand of nationalist historiography is unschooled as communal. And one of the reasons for a Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan series faring poorly in the marketplace of India, Indian historiography is the criticism that it represents that tendency. There has been no attempt hitherto made to understand and explicate the, uh, the implications of this interpretation. At the most general level, the concept of communal communalism has become for historians a compass that governs questions of interpretation, explanation, and method. So what is communal, communal in, the, in this whole enterprise? Anything that I don't agree with, 
Anything that the historian doesn't agree with is communal. It is a basket that holds all kinds of prejudices against a historian. So that is why, as I said, there is no, um, uh, no, uh, uh, it, it, communalism becomes a compass that governs questions. If you don't like the interpretation, you call it communal. If you don't like the explanation, you call it communal. You don't like the method that is used, you call it communal. So this is, a, uh, as I said, this is a, a way of dealing with historiography, which is absolutely unacademic and unscientific. There is virtually no discussion either on the concept or its use as a category of historiographical criticism. Apart from the naivete of assuming that independent India was unencumbered by its past and has Romila Thapa stated in a past and prejudice, in a sense, the coming of independence terminated the debate in its overt and recognizable form. This is, I would say, completely uh, wrong, did it? Were the issues raised by the earlier historians laid to rest or were they silenced? There is a very important book called Silencing the Past, by which the, the echoes of the past are laid to rest. They're not allowed uh, to, uh, uh, to reverberate in the debates of the present. Indian nationalism and its twist with destiny has, a, has an early prime minister of independent India triumphantly proclaimed on the day the transfer of power was effected was a poisoned chalice. The objective of Indian independence was belied by the tragedy of partition and questions about the shadow cast by the events of 1947 have lingered on. The boundaries of the debate have been set in a manner that effectively exclude questions about the responsibility for partition and the air of supreme triumphalism that is inherent in the speech just alluded to set the tones for the historians to follow. Perry Anderson, in his Indian ideology, has, has alluded to the Barbara Cartland streak in the discovery of India. Perry Anderson is one of the leading leftist historians, and he says that uh, discovery of India is essentially written like Barbara Cartland. And the general tendency is to avoid real issues about the convoluted road to the transfer of power. Khilafat agitation, Quit India movement, the boycott of the Crips movement were all important staging posts. And in each of these, the conduct of the dominant faction within the Indian National Congress was untenable. And therefore, questions about the road to independence and partition remained extremely uncomfortable for historians writing in the shadow of 1947. Why is it that these questions were ignored? Because the historians who came into prominence deliberately sought to uh, uh, not to go into these questions about, as I said, the complicity for 1947. The plan and scope of the BBV series. The Bharatiya Vidyabhan series consisted of 11 volumes, each of which addressed a significant aspect of Indian history. The general view that it mimics the periodization of Indian history, first suggested by James Mill, is not correct. Uh, has the series does not characterize the early period as Hindu period, nor does it speak of the medieval as the Muslim period. You know, repeatedly the charge has been made that this um, the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan series speaks of the Hindu period. They never once used that term uh, uh, during in any of the uh, uh, 11 volumes that have been published so far. These terms are not used in the text and therefore to argue that Mill's scheme of periodization was preserved in this work as Romila Thapar um, yeah, disingenuously has said on several occasions is not only incorrect, but can easily be disproved. James Mill, you know, as Javed Majid argues in his ungoverned imaginings, James Mill's The History of British India Orientalism, the utilitarian doctrines underlying Mill's work hardly had any impact on the subsequent study of India. Mill, uh, well, uh, Mill was, after the uh, Charter Act of 1833, Mill had uh, virtually lost his relevance until the historians of the 20th century started saying that Mill was the progenitor of the so-called communal version of writing history. In any event, the cautious policy prescriptions of Mill were soon superseded by Lord Macaulay's Minute of Education, May 2, 1835, over-interpreting Mill is responsible for exaggerating his influence on the subsequent historiography of India. Empire and statecraft, this whole idea of communal statecraft. Uh, which is what I, the study of the recurring patterns of imperial political formations and their transmutation into various forms is an important theme in Indian historiography. As I said, overall, there is a theme of uh, unity. Uh, the nation and its fragments, Partha Chatterjee would say, but the nation 
may occasionally fragment, but the nation is not the subtotal of its fragments. That is what they would like India to be, a, a, a nation of fragments. But no, India or Bharat Bash is much greater than the sum total of its fragments. The BBB series addresses this particular issue in three major volumes, the age of imperial unity, the classical age, and the age of imperial canal, stretching from the Mauryan age till the fall of the Pushyabhuti Empire towards the close of the 8th century AD. The three volumes are structured around the unification of India under the rule of dynamic and charismatic dynasties led by the powerful Chakravarti. Here the idea of Chakravarti, personages whose political fortunes were buttressed by a series of fortuitous matrimonial alliances with clans and lineages in their territory. The organizational scheme employed is certainly founded on narrative political history, but its conceptual topos is predicated on the long durée of in Indian history, the alternate rhythm of political expansion, contraction, and eventual replacement of one set of political arrangements initiated by a rival uh, clan or lineage with nested under the previous imperial carapace. If you look at this one element of continuity that there is an imperial system but that imperial system itself breaks down and a, and a part a subsidiary part of the system takes over eventually that has been the rhythm the logic underlying um, indian history right up to the 13th century the gupta dynasty is generally regarded as the archetypal instance of indian imperial history in that its history illustrates the transformation of the kingdom under a maharaja in the third century it, 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 AD into um, a powerful empire embracing the entire territory of India south of the Himalayas re uh, and represents the apotheosis of kingship expounded in the text known as the Dharma Shastras that contain the informing principles of Raja Dharma. See, the idea of the Dharma Shastras and Raja Dharma are very important. They are the concepts behind Indian statecraft. And, and if you look at uh, Romila Thapa's uh, um, analysis of uh, Raja Dharma, she would uh, make it appear as it, it is merely a Brahmanical ideology. The, the, uh, uh, the Raja Dharma has practiced uh, from, by the Guptas seem to be any uh, way further away from this idea of uh, the Brahmanas. The Gupta era appropriately uh, inaugurated by the establishment of a new era in uh, 320 AD was marked by a steady pace of territorial expansion and the articulation of an imperial ideology that was the template for the most of the early medieval period. The Allahabad pillar inscriptions of Samudra Gupta is the earliest expression of the new grandiose vision. Uh, for the first time, you have the use of the Sanskrit language uh, for the for the expression of a political idea. So statecraft begins to use the Sanskrit language uh, for expression of its ideas, its concepts, um, and to articulate its vision you know, of politics. The, the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan volume entitled The Classical Age does not refer to this period as golden age, and much of the polemic directed against this idea seems misplaced. The title Maharaja the Raja, assumed by Samadhi Gupta and proclaimed in the Allahabad a pillar in uh, Allahabad inscription presupposes the very existence of a substratum of little kings who presence in the imperial polity sustained its legitimacy. If we look at the distribution of the territories enumerated in the inscriptions, the Malavas, the Ar uh, Arjun, uh, Arjunayas, the Yaudiyas, the Madrakas, the Abhiras, the uh, Prajunas, the uh, Sanakanikas, the Takas, and the Kara, uh, Karabarikas, we find some of the some of them were amongst the 16 Janapadas of the Buddhist text. Most of these Janapadas were once part of the territories of the Indo-Greek rulers and were brought under the imperial framework for the first time. So this idea behind was not an expansion of a Brahmanical kingship, but essentially the idea of unification, a unification of territories that had been lost because of either the Kushana, well, I'm sorry, because of the Indo-Greeks or later the Kushana rule. Well, I'll give you one example of how this, Darshan, this uh, Harsha, the ruler of of uh, Kashmir uh, was uh, referred to as a Turushka in Raja Tarangini's, uh, in Kalahana's or Raja Tarangini. He's called a Turushka, and for some reason, he was um, a breaker of temples. Uh, and and uh, and because of that, uh, he is. Uh, because of that, uh, you know, uh, uh, he is used as a prototype of a medieval king, a medieval uh, uh, Hindu king, he's like Harsha. 
and uh, and um, uh, Mahirakula is another example that that is taken. Mahirakula was a convert to Shaivism, and he was also a Han. And, and the example of these two, Harsha and Mahirakula, are used to show that Indian rulers too were iconoclastic destroyers of temples, just like the Turkish rulers later on. And so, what is there uh, for uh, people to uh, to uh, uh, talk about uh, um, any of this? So, the classical age, which the uh, volume three of the VVP series uh, frames the entire period, has one of recovery and resurgence uh, uh, from the ravages of foreign invasion, Huns and others, and the reemergence of indigenous polity that reunited or regathered the territory traditionally regarded as part of Aryavarta, a concept explicitly mentioned in the Samudragupta inscription. Uh, Bharatvarsha consists of Aryavarta and Dakshinapada. And lines 20 and 21 refer to Dakshinapada and Aneka Aryavrata Raja. So these are concepts, territorial concepts. It has nothing to do with race, as if uh, Aryan race was being given some kind of uh, um, importance in these areas. These, the Aneka Aryavrata Raja was essentially places where the sages and the rituals were taking place. These terms are mere geographical expressions, and so it would be churlish to make them carry the burden of identity-driven, ideologically weaponized meaning. Importantly, the Dharma Shastra text has Gautama text refers to in the Yavanas, and this may give an indication of the time or period in which it was composed. Patrick Olivel uh, uh, dates the text to the third century BC and identified the Yavanas with the Greeks who form part of the population of northwestern India. The creation of an intellectual structure to underpin an expanding political system was the achievement of the three centuries of Gupta rule. Sheldon Pollock has drawn attention to an important feature of the Dukta period when he argued that the shift from Prakrit to Sanskrit has the preferred language of political communication and the deployment of Kavya has a rhetorical trope for articulating issues of genealogy, descent, political ideology, and social form are to be viewed as innovations introduced in the cultural milieu that created the Gupta age. There is absolutely no suggestion anywhere in the series that the Gupta age constituted a golden age um, and hence, the invective uh, directed against the uh, R.C. Mojumdar and his work seems not only uh, misplaced, but highly tendentious. Just as uh, James Mill's scheme of periodization was at best a flicker in the long course of colonial historiography, the idea of the golden age too remains a convenient straw man against which the brave Don Quixote's uh, can lead that progressive charge. The, the Dharma Shastra text has Olive, uh, Olive, uh, Olivelle has argued are codifications not of ritual but of custom, achara, and, uh, and historians who use the text as sources of past practice are confusing theology with history. I make this point, they are confusing theology with history. Therefore, the entire construction of the Golden Age nostalgia attributed to some historians is in reality a chimera, as neither A.N. Goshal nor R.C. Mojumdar have made such a claim. Finally, questions of uh, historical change and society. One of the most frustrating features of the early historiography of India is a vexed question of change in society and economy. Political change reflected in dynastic upheavals are clearly visible and hence provide a, a reliable chronological framework. And this has been the scholarly practice in professional historiography. The Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan follows the standard practice of using dynastic labels as markers of larger cultural and uh, social transformation. This understanding of temporality is predicated on the assumption that while politics and military events bubble and forth, bubble forth at the surface, there are deeper and profounder, profound forces at work, and our sources tend to give at best a partial view. Therefore, while the narrative informing the BBB series is informed and structured by political events, there is certainly considerable discussion on the economic and social changes taking place beyond the political. 
foreign invasions and its impact of India has been uh, has an important almost perennial theme of Indian historiography, partly due to the fact that the past was viewed as a prologue to the nationalist movement, which sought to create a united India without allowing identity divisions based on language and religion. I, I would like to point out to this recent book by uh, Richard Eaton. He calls it the Persianate Age and includes India as if it is part of the Persianate Age. When we look at history, the invasions that have happened, and Professor Mukherjee also uh, referred to the, uh, the Arab invasion of Sindh, an important landmark indeed. That's the time when the um, Umayyad uh, Caliphate uh, made a successful attempt at, the, uh, uh, at uh, um, expanding into the uh, in, uh, Indian subcontinent. But what really brought the conquests, the foreign conquests into India were the Turkish invaders who are called Turushka. And the Turushkas came from Central Asia into parts of Khorasan and from there driven out uh, to uh, Ghaz, uh, the Ghaznavids, the Ghurids. And it is the Turks, the Turushkas who came into India. And in fact, even the Mongols, the Mughal rulers like Babur are essentially uh, Turks. And so if at all there is any great uh, uh, rule um, um, uh, uh, Islamic rule, uh, I think the, uh, the credit or discredit as the case may be, should go to the Turks and therefore the Indian uh, sources are quite uh, uh, correct when they uh, uh, label uh, these invaders as Turushka and, and Turushka is invariably followed by uh, records of the destruction of temples. Now, when it comes to destruction of temples, there is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, a very strange argument that is made that uh, indigenous rulers, and they give the one solitary example that they give is of Harsha, Harsha of Kashmir. True, there has been displacement of images uh, from different parts of India, but these displaced images were never desecrated, they were never mutilated, they were in fact housed with great honor in the capitals of those kings who conquered. There is a tradition in my part of India that Rajendra Chola brought back uh, a Pala uh, image. And till today in Tanjavur, you can see an image in the great temple, which is of Pala origin. You can make out from the stylistic features. And it is there with all honor, with all um, due respect and adoration. Till today, that image is under worship. Similarly, uh, when uh, his son and successor, Rajendra the I, invaded the Chalukyan territory, he brought back an, uh, an image of Surya. And till today, in Dangai Kunda Sholapuram, you have that image that is given uh, a due place of honor. But this is not the case with the Turkish rulers. Uh, and their own historians, like Minaj Siraj in Tabakati in Nasiri, gives enough evidence with uh, uh, which uh, Sitaram Goyal has also documented in his book, What Happened to Indian uh, Temples. Destruction of temples following an ideological prescriptions of the Islamic texts was practiced in India right up to 1707 and probably beyond that. And okay, now uh, historians like Finbar, Finbar Flood, they have said that what is wrong, this is like uh, uh, the re reuse of architectural features, you know, the architectural members of older buildings that are being reused, what they call translation. This, this idea of translation of, art, uh, uh, of ar architectural artifacts is not like spoilias. This in Greek and Roman tradition of uh, you have spoilia, old temples being re the material being reused for new temples. Pausanias, the great um, historian, he said, uh, talking about spoilia, he said you're worshiping gods with other people's incense. That is what he he said. You're worshiping gods with other people's incense. But in the case of the Turkish rulers in India. It is not worshiping God. It is the destruction of the gods of the indigenous people that was being um, valorized as part of the Islamic um, um, ideology or part of the uh, establishment ritual of these states. So, and, and therefore we have to accept that the destruction of indigenous culture was very much a part of this uh, uh, tendency uh, that we notice. So the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan series is a very important intervention 
and I think it is necessary for us to take such books, and I would like to uh, read uh, the, the edited volumes of Professor Dilip Chakravarti, because I have not, I've heard of it, but I've not had the opportunity of, uh, uh, of reading it. And if uh, opportunity presents itself, I will certainly do so. So what I have done today is to try to contextualize the reasons why the this multi-volume set, which is so rich in ideas, and it passed, um, uh, and it is based on all um, principles of historiographical research, um, protocols of historical analysis, uh, uh, why it was neglected by historians and the criticism. More importantly, what I have tried to do is to look at that criticism. I've taken that criticism seriously and tested that criticism against uh, the content of the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan, and I found that there it is one thing. The Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan certainly is a very innovative series, and uh, it, it uh, and it does not uh, contain any of the deficiencies which the left uh, have tried to attribute it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Venkat. It was a wonderful talk, and I fully agree with you. When I was in Delhi University. We were told the students were told not to consult the volumes of the series because they're supposed to be communal and all that. Uh, it was fairly disgusting. In fact, the historians who came in after this particular phase, the phase of represented by Mujumdar and others, whatever. I have read of them makes me feel convinced that this is about the dirtiest series of historians that India has had the misfortune of generating historians for the last 60 years. Pure and simple garbage. I don't trust that data unless I see them. As simple as that. I don't believe in whatever Romila Thapar see our rules or rights unless I see the original source and thing. It is as simple as that. I do know that in archaeology, they've done a lot of distortions. I mean, they don't have any business to criticize others. They're not competent enough. They're not even hardworking. At this age of 80, I'm sad to confess that I have read only two books by Ramila Thapar. One is her PhD thesis, which is good PhD thesis, well written. But then you see in India, there is easy way of finding what is good or bad in Indian history writing. That is the level of English. She writes good English by our standard. So that's a good thesis. It's as simple as that. The second book I read was from lineage to state. Having read that, I gave up reading all her books. But I have read some books by her students. Malicious, distorting data. Distorting even printed data. If they cite a particular reference, they don't believe what is what the author writes about it, unless you read it in original. So, Bengkot has raised a very tricky issue, the issue of the series. I mean, that was a landmark thing, in fact, in Indian history writing. Sarajindu, would you ask anything? Or would you want to participate in this discussion of the series? I think we can throw it open if people have questions, and then we'll go to the final uh, session of the day, which will be chaired yeah. by Professor Rajveer Sharma. Mm -hmm. Should we continue or what? Should I continue or? Yes, please, please, please. Yeah, very valid uh, questions uh, have been raised. And Dilivda has uh, come down 
to the basics have a very dishonest people uh, non professional attitude and everything is sought to be seen in terms of immediate uh, gain career gains uh, publication jobs and things like that this is uh, not the way to any serious studies special history and history uh, has been a very very important subject uh, that's why there's always controversy when historians say something which doesn't suit the establishment but uh, now is a small group in shimla this group uh, we all are more or less unanimous i have not heard the list of the speakers now there's a unanimity among us about the grave defects uh, the serious problem that we have <laughs> the task is how we can go about it how to solve it how to sort it out and how we can provide perfect better textbooks and a more scientific syllabus now that is a real test so as long as we can't do it these uh, discussions uh, remain isolated peripheral to the uh, academic discourse as controlled by ugc and various funding organizations you see my experience about these uh, organizations uh, i was a member of icsr uh, 20 years back for two terms now this is my sixth year last uh, fortunately last year in ics icsr you know and everywhere uh, there are big problems uh, uh, difficult finding um, good scholars very difficult though may be holding high positions dean or vice chancellor the 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 publication track record is very very poor and then people are not ready even after change of government to do something important which challenges the uh, status quo fortunately just one line i will say uh, in my first term with icsr and professor rao was a chairman as keeping my interest in mind i had a special project to launch this most prestigious project that is a demographic and politics and i took up punjab and uh, bengal uh, punjab and khulna it is lahore and khulna and fortunately i was able to get a good team of scholars who work on punjab and in bengal and the project was submitted in time three hours time the project had been finalized i spent almost every second day i will look at every line and word Uh, uh certain things i was very satisfied now icsr i don't know how long they will take it to publish it they have submitted two years back and they said it is gone for review i don't know because there is a lot of internal politics in our system also <laughs> somebody said acha acha this man has done it so start it so that is our problem the so called left i said left jihadi group i don't say left left is a facade for islamic agenda so is the left jihadi group helped by the nehruvian state they had a struggle hold they had a united team their focus basics they were united our team they are still you know the academic group associated with this system <laughs> they are still not sure what line to take so that is confusion and there is i don't want i can be more explicit so things are not proceeding on the lines you wanted fine you can talk about more of these things problems actual problems that you face uh, to come out with scientific objective uh, history we don't have to resort to any untruth without the, the left is dead we are factual honest true to the facts we can produce very good history which is let's destroy uh, the received truth of the subject and you can come out with absolutely very fascinating honest history so let's wait for that day let's try let's build our team and uh, when uh, the time comes probably our team will be able to provide uh, a cool book textbooks for all, all levels school class for to everyone college university good research good publications thank but i don't know when that you, that dawn will come professor sharma thank you so much amakal professor rajbir sharma questions are no question you will be chairing the next session so he will have an opportunity he will have an opportunity to try to sum up and uh, give his views in the next session i think professor raju has something to say i have that intuition Oh, sorry, I didn't. Yeah, I mean, this is 
You you have to be louder, sir. Professor Raju. We can barely hear you. Okay, let me try. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is great. Again, you're very quiet. Again, you've become very soft. Earlier, when you said, "Let me try," it worked well. Not very good, I'm afraid. Not very good. Can't hear you well. Not much. There's a lot of background noise as well. Yes. I'm the twenty first of the morning. I can also request others to mute themselves, please, if you don't mind. Yeah, that may be the reason. There are several mics on. Anyhow, you can raise the question, and we may okay. repeat it if required. Yeah, yeah. So the question is very simple. Uh, what is uh, Romila Tatwad's uh, uh, grounds against Max Muller? Why does she say falsehoods about him? Because they're just direct falsehoods which are not present in the original sources. So since you people are quite knowledgeable about her, maybe somebody can answer that question. I'm sorry if it is off the track, but it is entirely off the track. Did you get my question? Yes, I heard it. I can repeat it. The question which Professor Raju admits is off track is follows why does romila thapar say all kinds of things about max muller which are not in the original source that is the question should i you got muted professor agotham you got muted Should I try or I mean please, I please, 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 please. yes okay. yes please yes. do please do and this will be the last uh, thing then we'll move to the next session go ahead because we are absolutely on time we started half an hour late after lunch so instead of ending at three thirty we we are ending at around four so this will be the last comment and then we will request <laughs> Professor Chakravarti to say a few words to close the session. And everybody who spoke in this session is invited to the next session as well. Uh, please, please mute your mics because somebody's mic has a lot of background. I don't know whose. I'm trying to figure out whose mic has a lot of background noise. Anyhow, go ahead, go ahead, Professor Agotham, go ahead. You see, uh, Pro uh, Max Mueller uh, has a very ghostly presence in much of the writings of uh, of Romila Thapa. Why it should be so? Because most his most of them rely on the sacred books of the East because they don't read Sanskrit, and so the uh, the, uh, the 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 text that is accessible to them is essentially the fifty volumes of uh, the sacred books of the East. Now there is um, why see this um, Max Mueller was you know quite he, he was not an in, uh, uh, Indophile I wouldn't say he's an Indophile but he was not Indophobic either he was somewhere you know he was he had an intellectual curiosity about India that that uh, that was not in any way colored by the Victorian. A kind of racial prejudices. He was, uh, I, I think, and 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 so he he was never patronizing to India, and that is one of the reasons why the uh, the uh, and and he was one of the early people who probably did not fully subscribe to the Aryan invasion theory. In fact, that uh, that is the uh, crux of the matter. He was one. Yes. Of the, yeah, that uh, he, that's yeah, the crux of the issue. To, she uh, he did not subscribe, and there yeah. lies the animus that this school of history uh, has directed against Max Mueller. Otherwise, you know, I do find some of Max Mueller's writings a little, you know, off 
of color now, I mean, given the 150 years between his day and ours. But then the main reason is because he did not subscribe to the Aryan invasion theory. That's that I think is basically the key. The point is she accuses him of subscribing to the Aryan race theory, which he does not subscribe to. Yes. Why does she do that? She does that in a paper in the social scientist of the Aryan race theory. He does have complexion, this and that and so on. Complete falsehood. Yes, it is. It is. I just learned that it's complete falsehood. Because if you read Max Muller, he denies the Aryan race theory yeah, completely. Uh, and she accuses him of it. Why does she do that? You don't understand. You know, I think we should uh, we should stop this here. I will uh, just invite Professor Chakravarti in one minute. But, you know, there are people who have been tracking Professor Romila Thapar's work and the amount of, I don't want to use the word falsehoods, you use that word, but the amount of inconsistencies, <laughs> unsubstantiated claims, the lack of evidence for assertions, it's so immense, it runs into two or three pages, full scap pages with page numbers, you see. So I think we will simply leave it uh, at that, why she does it, why she misascribes the Aryan invasion theory to Max Miller is a puzzle. I mean, why she claims that Bharativita Bhavan is using James Mills's periodization and uh, a variety of other claims she makes she makes them, it's a puzzle. But what is not a puzzle is why she has been exalted, given the Library of Congress uh, award and this award and that award. As I said, I saw it personally starting to happen in 1977, when she was still, I think, teaching in a college, she, uh, or at Kofi, I can't remember where. And that, uh, you know, that uh, you might say that... Uh, concerted push to make her a kind of star long before she went even to JNU. So all this was started, and that points to the, the what uh, both uh, Professor Saradindu Mukherjee and Professor Ragotam have pointed out, that there is an organized group which, which manages things, and the other side is disorganized, characterized by infighting, all kinds of other issues. So I think we'll just leave it at that. I, I invite Professor Chakrabarti to give his concluding remarks and we'll uh, move to the next session. Sir, please unmute yourself. Uh, well, thank you very much, and thank you too for wonderful, wonderful lectures, both Bengkot and Sarindu. Possibly it is time to for the next session to begin. Yes, indeed. But would you like to say a few words to conclude the session, sir? Of your own observations, your own observations. It has been an excellent session. I have learned a lot from both these lectures. Uh, because I'm a refugee from East Bengal, Bangladesh, once upon a time. Uh, I was I suppose more keenly interested in what Sharadindu had to say about this matter, but it has been a very well researched talk actually on that topic. On this Shahinbag education, I had always great misgivings. Somebody must have put the entire crowd to it because there is absolutely no logical basis of disputing this particular legal formulation. It's as straight as that. And thank you, Venkat, for going through the Vidya Bhavan series so thoroughly. And it was very badly necessary. 
somebody should have defended this little chest. Very important thing. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to all three, uh, especially to Professor Dilip uh, Chakrabarti, who joined us from Cambridge. He's 80 years old. He has got up at 4 a.m. in the morning, and all his life he has worked so hard, you know, all his life, wherever he was. So you're a great example to us, and uh, I hope that the younger generation also learns from you the dedication to scholarship and, uh, you know, to the life of the mind and the consistent production of high quality work. Uh, and uh, we have just, I've just sent uh, a message to our librarian to see if we have the VIS series. If not, we are ordering it. Uh, and uh, I'm very grateful you got up at four o'clock to join us this morning. Uh, and uh, also, a uh, wonderful session. Thank you, Professor Sharadindu. I think you were like a bomb blast, so to speak. You said, uh, <laughs> though, though of uh, intellectual kind, I won't uh, use these words uh, loosely in today's context, but uh, you hit very hard. You pointed to things. You, you pointed out the deficiencies, our certificate and approval-seeking character and mentality all the time, appeasement at the... At the at the expense of our very existence, which we have seen carried out with the same template you know, from Sindh to Kashmir in 1991. I'm talking about Sindh in the uh, 7th century to Kashmir in 1991, the same template. And, uh, and Sindh, it still goes on. I think I read yesterday in the papers that 70 bonded laborers who were Hindus were converted by a Qazi to Islam and sin in exchange of freedom. Uh, so the last, the last phase of the genocide of the Hindus in sin is carried out. And every other week we hear of abduction of, of underage girls who are then married off and converted. So this is going on on a daily basis. You've talked about 1%. And of course, uh, the uh, the sad truth of East Bengal, uh, which is still, I mean, every day people are crossing over. Everybody knows this. Anyone who has eyes and ears will know. Go to Mushirazabad, go to the border areas, and uh, you will see. I mean, in my own experience, we had students from uh, Bangladesh and JNU, and the Hindus did not want to go back. They said there's no life there for us. And somehow we will stay here, whatever it takes. So these are facts, and, and in some ways we are in denial, of course. Now, we don't know what the solution is, frankly. I mean, this is not the space for it, but you have pointed out these things. You have pointed out the salience of CAA, the Constitutional Amendment Bill. And, uh, 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 you know, you have put it in its historical context. And you've been very hard-hitting. You've named names. You've also told us your own experience of working in the system with all its drawbacks, the blacklisting, right? The branding, the, uh, uh, you know, the, div the division in the discipline. I told you that history as a discipline is at war with itself in India. And uh, I will say a little more about it in the next session as I invite Professor... Rajvirji. But thank you, Professor Raghottam. That was a beautifully written paper. Everything you write is in such such lovely English. I appreciate the language. It's very post-colonial, by the way, in the hard-hitting and, and polemical analysis. It's like a literary critical text. So, I mean, we keep sparring about it. I've written a book, uh, as it were, questioning post-colonialism because I find it's a kind of neo-colonialism, frankly. And its proponents all have tenure. They are comfortably ensconced in the Western Academy. Uh, and uh, it's really a continuation with the Brown Sahib, the Brown Sipo, who is doing the work of a former imperialist. And, uh, I mean, we won't go into that, but it's a wonderful analysis of the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan. 
series. I hope you do the same for the VIF series because I don't think any work of this magnitude has been published in between. And uh, I, I mentioned another series, The Cultural History of India, brought out by the Ramakrishna Mission Institute of Culture. That also bears an analysis like yours. In fact, we would be very happy, uh, you know, if something of this kind can be done, uh, a visiting professorship, a series of lectures on this somehow, would be a great uh, contribution, followed by a small book on this. Because if you did a book analyzing three of these series, and even if it's a book of 100 pages, I think it would be a great contribution to knowledge. And I know you have some spare time now. You're also retired. Uh, though I think from the background, are you still at HRDC? No, Professor. I have. Uh, I am. Uh... We can't hear you. Okay. Now we can you? We can't hear you, sir. We can't hear. Uh, yeah, I'm... are you at the UNESCO chair in Pondi now? hear you. Now, can you hear me? No. Yes, yes. Yeah, I am completely free now. I have retired. I got a two-year extension. That also is over. And now I am on my own. So I'm available for whatever uh, intellectual um, service I can be. So I'm now completely uh, free in the, in the good, real sense. Good, of good. So no institution I think... public obligation. So. I think... I think that is itself, I think that is itself Varaj, not having yes. institutional obligation. Yes. But thank you all on that note. That note, thank you. Please stay with us for the next session, which I will introduce very briefly. Uh, as it happens, uh, we've had a dropout uh, uh, and a very, very uh, good scholar, I won't take his name, he's written brilliant books, but felt uncomfortable. You see, this is the feature of our discipline. Now, don't blame him because he's not yet tenured fully. So whatever, everyone has to protect their interests. And uh, I think we are much freer to say, say what we like. But unfortunately, the, 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 the discipline is so divided. Uh, and I think uh, uh, some of our speakers have been marked uh, so that uh, there, is a, there is an untouchability. I have experienced it in JNU. I've been a professor at JNU for 20 years, and whenever I organize something, uh, a section of the faculty would, would boycott it, a section of the students would boycott it. So I have experienced this uh, for forever. Forever. I can't remember a time when... And I consider myself a very liberal person, frankly. Liberal Eastern and Indian or Western. I, I truly want to listen to all kinds of views, but somehow we function in a situation where, you know, people get marked, and I think uh, uh, many people are afraid of Professor Mukherjee also, <laughs> if I might say so. Uh, and uh, and uh, I'm sure uh, Professor Raghottam is notorious at Pondicherry University for saying things. I don't know how he has the courage. He calls out the Dravidian identity politics. Sometimes I'm afraid that somebody may manhandle him. He goes out. I always worry about him. But he's, he's so urbane. He speaks beautifully. And uh, he, he speaks better Tamil than anybody I know. He knows the text. And uh, so, I mean, I hope that uh, we don't come, come to a situation. I think in, in Bengal, things are not very good. People get manhandled there. Uh, or should I say woman handled? I don't know how to put it. Uh, without uh, without uh, you know sounding uh, sounding alarmist in today's uh, environment. But having said that, I now invite uh, Professor Rajvir uh, Sharma ji. He just finished his tenure. He produced a wonderful piece of work on the Arthashastra, which has been accepted by Sage. And uh, it's it's really an open session because there's no speaker. So Rajvi ji, you can please make your observations and invite. Anybody to say whatever they want for about half an hour, and then we'll conclude. And tomorrow, again, we resume at 9 o'clock. The session will be chaired by Lavanya ji, and we are looking forward to Professor Andre Wink, 
who is now in Athens, but he's done pioneering work on the so-called medieval or Islamic period in India. So with these words, uh, I invite uh, Professor Rajvi Sharma ji to, to conduct the last session of the day. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And welcome. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. But uh, unfortunately, I not to make any kind of a presentation. Uh, to sit and listen. And uh, so far as uh, this uh, afternoon session is highly illuminating, very informative, and very argumentative also in character and nature. However, the the uh, the um, uh, the the issues in history have always been uh, taken up in different ways. The approaches have differed, the methods have differed, and uh, the linkages between theory and practice also have differed. And uh, in this case, I can say that uh, for a quite long time, history in India has been the, the kind of uh, the proprietary uh, right of a certain uh, school of thought and anyone who differed from that school of thought was termed as either communal or uh, non-scholarly kind of uh, uh, people. If anybody wanted to uh, to uh, denounce anyone as a non-scholar, then uh, that was the other school of thought. If you, you never wanted to recognize the scholarship of certain uh, people, belonging to other school of thought, the nationalist school of thought, they were called as, uh, you know, non-scholars. But anyway, the, the issue that has been left today was the contribution of A.O. Hume uh, in the uh, national uh, freedom movement, or what we call uh, the, the British dimensions of uh, nationalism. And here I would like to, uh, to draw your attention to the fact that A.O. Hume, in fact, and, the, and his Congress uh, has been visualized and visioned by different historians and scholars in different ways. And in fact, uh, after 1857, which uh, some historians uh, called uh, the, the result of the mutiny, and uh, whereas uh, uh, persons, nationalists like uh, uh, Savarkar, termed it as the first war of independence, but since 1857, there was a sea change uh, in the relationship between uh, the, the uh, people of India and the government of India. And uh, mainly after that event, there was a growing uh, disenchantment. There was a, a growing anguish and angst. There was a growing alienation in the, in the uh, Indian masses from uh, the government. At the same time, if we look at the background of uh, uh, in, uh, A.O. Hume and the establishment of Indian National Congress, then it was not merely uh, the 1857, but there were so many other events also that had shaken the faith and the trust of the people in the, in the efficacy of the government of India and the concerns for the miseries uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, Indian people. For example, I would like to uh, to mention two or three uh, things that had taken place. There were uh, the you know the Vernacular uh, Press Act and several other legislations, which in fact visited the of Indian uh, Indian population. Uh, Ilbert Bill, for example, was another uh, another case which alienated people of India from from the British government. Then in the 60s and 70s, there were large-scale famines in the country, and many people uh, lost their lives. The uh, government of uh, India did not pay the attention they, uh, they were expected to uh, pay and address the uh, problems of Indian people. So all these events, you know, uh, uh, taken together, uh, impacted uh, the, the uh, approach and attitude of the people of India towards the British government. At that time, uh, it became imperative, I think, for the British government to, to search for certain, certain, certain biomedias, certain alternatives, so that this process of alienation 
can be put to a full stop too, or at least the possibilities of a revolt uh, by the people of India could be prevented or could be halted, or it could have been a, a kind of a consideration at the at the level of the uh, British government that the people who were leading uh, the, the movement at that time, they should in fact be brought into some kind of a uh, interactive relationship or dialogic relationship with, uh, with the government. So I think it was with this, with this background that A.O. Hume, who was the member of the Indian Civil Service uh, for quite some time in India, and uh, he, in fact, perhaps was motivated that he could uh, bridge the gap uh, between the people of India and the British uh, government, and the possibilities of any kind of a resentment or revolt could be uh, could be minimized, if not totally eliminated, if there is a link, if there is a communication link between uh, or a mediator between the people and uh, and the British government. Perhaps with this uh, motive. Um, uh, the Theosophical Society, of which uh, A.O. Hume was a member and was quite impacted by, by the philosophy and the ideology of Philosophical Society. Now, Theosophical Society, thereafter, you know, he, he in fact impacted or uh, motivated the Indian youth and the leaders who were really not feeling easy with the British government come out and establish an organization. So, in 1882, he retired from the civil service, and then in 1885, uh, A.O. Hume established uh, uh, with the help of uh, the, the uh, leaders of Indian national movement, the, the organization, uh, which some people say was a governmental machination, you know. And, uh, and later on, he became a person who was trusted neither with, by the Indians nor by the British. Even many viceroys, including the most uh, notable is Dufferin, who in fact uh, started abusing A.O. Uh, Hume, called him idiot, called him a person who doesn't have a sense, and so on and so forth. A.O. Uh, Hume, in fact, was a person who pleaded for social and political reforms uh, and administrative reforms uh, in the country, and perhaps he was, he was convinced that if the people of India are given some kind of participation in the administrative system, and if certain political and social reforms are introduced by the British government, it will definitely improve the relationship. And perhaps uh, it is also clear that the impact of, uh, of uh, A.O. Hume's uh, ideology on the Indian National Congress was quite visible because uh, the, the Indian National Congress, in fact, moved on the lines of uh, of A.O. Hume. He, he also wanted only reforms and no freedom from the British. In fact, he was pleading that if the British were able to reform the administration and politics, it is enough. Because he said that those who are leading the Indian National uh, Movement, they must, in fact, aspire for more freedom, for more say, for more intervention, and so on and so forth. He also never brought the question of freedom from the British rule. He never pleaded for the freedom of, from the British rule. And for quite some time, even Congress also uh, did not uh, uh, bring it to the agenda of, uh, of the party to demand uh, the complete freedom or even freedom from the British rule. In fact, it was later that they started first talking of dominion status, and then uh, they came to demand the complete freedom uh, from the British rule. There were there were divisions within the Congress also later, uh, which uh, who uh, which in fact led to some kind of two ideologies within the Congress. Those who wanted uh, to to be with the, uh, to be happy with the dominion status, and those who wanted to fight for uh, freedom as a whole. So therefore, uh, even A. O. Hume, in fact. Uh, to me, was not uh, pro-India uh, as such. He, he, in fact, was pleading or taking the cause of British more than that of India. That is how I, I look at the uh, contribution of A.O. Hume. But I must um, uh, conclude by saying that uh, history writing in India 
has in fact been a, a kind of a uh, contested vision. Uh, you know, there's no unanimity uh, on the uh, historical events or their interpretations, and it will go on. But I'm uh, happy that uh, at least some scholars now have got the courage to call a spade and spade and challenge, and challenge the uh, well entrenched traditional kind of uh, history writing, which in fact may not be the complete truth. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Sharma. I just wanted to say that, uh, uh, you know, the first demand for Purna Swaraj was in 1906 in the Surat Congress, which split the Congress uh, between the Garam Dal and the Naram Dal. And Hume was back in uh, London, back in England by 1892, I think. And he was uh, demoted from uh, service for encouraging yes. Indians to form a political association. I mean, uh, uh, an important document is the letter he wrote to the graduates of the Kolkata University in 1870. But anyhow, our interest in Hume was because one of our former fellows, Professor S.R. Mehrotra, was, uh, you know, collecting his works along with Edward Moulton, Professor Edward Moulton uh, of, uh, I think, uh, Canada, Manitoba. And then Professor Merotra passed away his papers. Uh, the, the speaker was supposed to speak today uh, is taking that work forward. In Shimla, we have a special interest because Hume lived in Shimla in a place called Rothney Castle. And uh, he was a polymath. I mean, we can't expect See, one of the things I've learned is nobody can be expected. You know, no one else will work for you. If you're, I mean, whether it's the British or if, you, if you're espousing the cause of, you know, Hindu refugees, you know, don't expect the UN or anybody else to do it. So, I mean, I have no expectation, you know, post facto of Hume. That's not the point. I think that Hume was an extraordinary figure, and we have an interest because he was connected with Shimla, and he was demoted in the ICS. And then, you know, he, he was an expert. Of course, he started as the collector of Etawa. And he saw the Great Revolt firsthand. And then he was an expert on agricultural reform. Then he sort of spearheaded this movement, which resulted in the Indian National Congress. And their official histories have also more or less erased them. In addition, he was a great ornithologist and botanist. In fact, the largest single collection uh, donated to the British Museum, which then split into the British National Natural History Museum so, uh, and the British Museum, which is in Tavistock Square, Russell Square, that area. But there's another very, very big museum of natural history where if you go in and you'll see 80,000 specimens were donated by this one man, Alan Octavian Hume. And his brush for theosophy is also interesting. Blavatsky came to Shimla. So we had that, you know, Shim Shimla connection. And, he, and uh, Marotra Saab also was in Shimla. He passed away, uh, I think, a couple of years ago. Anyhow, with that said, thank you all. We've had a very rich day. And I think I'll only echo what Professor Rajvi Sharma said. History is always controversial. It's always a contested field. There will be interest at stake. And uh, in fact, you can also define history as the arrangement of the past uh, in terms of the needs of the present, the demands of the present, you see. And uh, once again, uh, I'm reminded of, uh, uh, you know, what uh, I've written this down because I was reading about it, what SR PK Kar said about the methodology of uh, Jadunath Sarkar. He said, cartograph, identification, chronology, corroboration. Earlier I had quoted R.C. Mazumdar also, and uh, where he said that, uh, uh, you know, facts are very important, that textbooks should not disseminate cults, whether of violence or of some other uh, ideology. And this and dials back to what Professor Mukherjee was saying, that facts will speak if properly presented and arranged. Uh, and uh, in that sense, I think there is the possibility of a new school of history either consolidating or emerging. We had the national school. Maybe it was eclipsed by the Marxist school.
Then there were other subaltern and other kinds of schools. Now, maybe there, will, then there may be a Hindutva school. I don't know. I, I think I'm the first one to label it as the Hindutva school uh, of history. I don't know if it will emerge. I don't know what its, uh, what its uh, founding or foundational principles will be. I'll just come to you, uh, uh, Sharad I'll just come to you in a minute. I don't know what its foundational principles will be. I quoted from Savarkar's War of Indian Independence, Ms. Swadharma and Swaraj. Can these be the foundational principles of a new school of historiography? We don't know. All these questions are up in the air. But uh, I think that uh, at least we can agree that uh, uh, there will be a, uh, uh, you know, a method of writing history which is professional, which is academic, which is rigorous, uh, which is vetted, which is uh, through peer reviews and other mechanisms. We can't dismiss uh, this kind of professional academic writing of history. At the same time, our understanding of the past as a civilization will also be informed by all kinds of other narratives, even if they don't have the epistemic stamp of history. There might be Puranas, Itihasas, Upapuranas, Thalapuranas, cultural memory, uh, maybe literature, uh, oral histories. All of these uh, rich sources and resources, of course, at the back of which are archaeology, epigraphy, inscriptions, and all the other tools of history as we know them. I think all of these together will give us a, a much richer understanding, uh, you know, of our own civilization. And personally, I'm convinced that uh, that this civilization had something very important to offer to the world. It still does. And uh, what it has to offer uh, is nothing short of some, I think, very fundamental ideas about the nature of human existence itself, of planetary existence, you know. And, uh, and uh, uh, the heroes that we celebrate were all people who tried to overcome the limitations of being human. And I think that in our Indian subcontinent, we have tried to deeply explore the meaning of human flourishing in all its aspects, as Prabhupada says in the Foundations of Indian Culture, that... Uh, uh, or what Ananda Kumaraswamy says. So I think that uh, the recovery, the reconstruction, uh, as well as the accessibility of uh, these riches are very important because from here it's not it's not dwelling the habit uh, habitation of the past. No, that's not the purpose of history to go into some sort of nostalgic golden world but it really helps uh, to understand who we are so that we can proceed from here uh, you know towards uh, towards uh, you know really as somebody said decolonization swaraj recovery so i think these these are uh, these are some of possibly the shared aims and intentions and i think problematizing historiography before we write uh, or interrogating historiography, before we produce new textbooks, uh, is uh, an absolute prerequisite as, as we see it. And that's why this dialogue, which purposes a continuing dialogue. And now I will, I will invite whoever wants to say whatever they want to say, with, uh, starting with Professor Mukherjee. Go ahead. And then we'll conclude. Some brief interventions and then we'll conclude. Yeah. Very briefly, uh, it was a pleasure listening to both my friend Ravi Sharma and Professor Bakun Paranjave. Now, I'll just comment because the Ravi Sharma's point, because uh, uh, Makramji has been talking about the philosophy of history. We fully sympathize, empathize, and I hope more and more we'll, the, our tribe will grow. And uh, we need not call it Hindutva history. We write objective history, scientific history. And if we just stick to facts, we can produce very good history. I'm firmly convinced, and whatever little I've written, peasants, uh, refugees, uh, whatever, in those relations, Khilafat, whatever I write, I always go by bare facts. People, my, my opponents might call me that I belong to this school and that school, but doesn't matter because I'm very sure of what I'm writing. 
and I uh, truly reflect, I write on the basis of facts, and I do research on archival facts, facts which is open. I don't keep citing books of uh, scholars of uncertain value. Now, now my purpose was not to intervene on this point. We'll uh, talk more and more about this, and I have shared ideas with Makaranji earlier also. Now, Rajvi Sharma's point is a general point. Is the Congress uh, whether Congress was set up as a safety valve, quote unquote theory. That is a, that, that is how it is taught. Two uh, examples I give you. Say the modern political parties uh, originates in Britain when uh, civil wars, 1640s. Uh, it starts with the fight between the king and the parliament, Stuart's king and parliament, civil war, 1640 to 47. Those uh, who uh, fought. For the king were called the roundheads. Those who opposed them were the cavaliers. So, and this subsequently became, after restoration, Whigs and Tories. And from that, the major political party evolved. And the first set of uh, the political ideas uh, grew up in the coffee houses, which we see in the late 17th century. Those who are familiar with the British history, they know how this originates. Now, Japan, so take another example, Japan. Uh, which is copying after Meiji Restoration, modernization 1868, Western ideas very fast. One of the things which happened also, the origin of the political parties, exactly same period when Dadavai Nauraji, Shuran Banerjee in Calcutta, Bombay, Pune, Madras, Hindu Mahajan Sabha, they are setting up political parties. In Japan, the first political parties, Riken Kaishinto, Riken, Riken Seukai, set up in 1860s. You know, what is the initial reaction to the government? Because Japanese are not used to Japanese. In typical team, the British evolutionary pattern, I'm not sounding very Whiggish, I think, evolved over a period of time. 1640s, Cavalier Roundheads, Restoration, Glorious Evolution, then Whigs and Tories, and by, say, Robert Peel's time, political parties are taking shape. Now, Japan is sudden, suddenly, Meiji Restoration, uh, American subcom started bombarding Nagasaki, the British are knocking at the door, they must modernize. So, modernize everything, right from calendar to the political system. So, initial reaction, Japanese, Riken Kaishinto, Riken Shaiko, what is this? Political parties, the factions, anti-state, must trust them. So, if you look at the repressive measures taken by the Meiji government, my God, Every hitting at every the press regulation act funding that this party should die a natural death. So this is the contrast. England so already some kind of parliament is evolving. Japan is not that. Different models of growth. India is sudden. No concept of political parties. We had a, a sense of statecraft going back to say Kautilla or even earlier times or subsequently. So anything, any political move post 1857 had to be very cautious. And still, I'm not, certainly you know that I'm not very pro, I'm anti-India, not pro-British. But still, whoever was there could not have been very, very bold. He couldn't have given a call for Bharat Chodo in 1870. It would have been disastrous. Disastrous. And, uh, whatever the revolutionaries in Maharashtra, Bengal, Punjab did, they did afterwards. Even say Aurobindo, with all his uh, contribution, he could not continue here to migrate to Pondicherry. So the problem is that is somehow have a soft, you know, uh, corner for Hume. Uh, I'm not being pro British, of course, you can make up. But any other option, I think, would have finished them off. Either they would have faced, faced a situation which Riken Kashinto, Riken Sayuka is facing in Japan 1860s because India is not Britain. Britain, the parliament goes back to the Anglo Saxon time, earliest, Magna Carta, series of reforms, Elizabethan times, Stuart time, fascinating development. And every state of history, something new has been added to it. So, India is a different case. So, I think we have to be more uh, uh, cautious in assessing any character in this area of transition. That's all. That's my submission. Fine. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I think the Congress official resolution for Pur Purna Swaraj was, I think, 1919. And the Surat Congress split in 1906. So, and Hume, 
was 1870 and then 1885. So I don't believe there was any demand for Purna Swaraj in 1885. There was no notion of Swaraj at that time. It was just coming up, 1880, 1886, Tilak, or 1889, or 1890s actually, Tilak started the Shivaji celebration, etc. But anyhow, we are getting sidetracked. I think we should uh, wind up now. We are, we are close to five o'clock. Professor Raju? Uh, uh, yeah. I have a simple question because there are so many historians here. My problem is that there isn't a single historian of science. Now, I have been engaging on this, trying to get people to do some history of science, particularly mathematics. And we just don't have people. And you were talking about uh, textbooks. Our textbooks have such extreme falsehoods. Euclid, where is this Euclid fellow? He doesn't exist. I've given a reward. Nobody wants to come and pick it up. Nobody wants to produce evidence. And you're just, uh, you know, uh, uh, it is just ignored out of existence. So I think that we need to have some history of science because if you recollect Macaulay, in his speech, in his minute on education, his key point was that India needs British education for the sake of science, because in sciences, we are tremendously superior. That was his assertion. And you actually look at, I'm sorry, uh, at Cambridge syllabus on Euclid. It is so laughable. You know, they are asserting, they are asserting that, you know, Euclid had some kinds of proof that syllabus the actual exam rules in Cambridge that you must follow the order of propositions in the elements. And this is something completely false because there is not a single axiomatic proof in the elements. But how do you explain it to people? This is ninth standard stuff and people don't understand it. What do you do? So I think there has to be some space for this history of science, for history of mathematics. It needs to have a discussion. To have a public discussion. You know, of if you course, don't have a course. public discussion, nothing happens. Of course, uh, Professor Raju, I, I think uh, institutions <laughs> such as NISTADs, NISTADs were set up precisely for this. And some work was also done, not of the scale of Joseph Needham's uh, <laughs> history of science in China. But, you know, uh, you know, I think uh, this man, Arnold, he's written a book. Uh, and there are Deepak Kumar has written a book on the oh, history no. of science. It's, uh, it's, can you it's, hear me? Am I audible at all? Yeah, yeah, I'm audible. Uh, you're audible. Uh, Deepak Kumar is an archivist. That is not called history of science. That is called some uh, nostalgia. Am I audible? For the... You are still audible, but not visible anymore. That Sir is Raju, nostalgia for the Raj. Are you a mathematician or a philosopher? Yes, yeah, I am both. <laughs> Is there a no. problem in being both? Yes. No, no, actually, no problem. Yes. Now, people have always been interested in the Indian history of science. There are volumes mm -hmm. of publications on that, as you know. Whose uh, volumes? For instance, but B. N. Shield wrote a book called Positive That's Science. That's very in old, very old. I, and, I get your point. Yeah, very, very old. Another character, that's another character called Binoy Kumar Sarkar, who yeah, also yeah, wrote a book in the Those are 1900s. Early 1900s. Fine, but it's yes. a fine book. They're very scholarly. There are, yeah, there are now, books. They're David, out of David, date. Uh, grossly out of date. Fine. David Arnold is out of date. Other people have written extensively on the history of mathematics. Who has? And history of chemistry, physics, etc. Nobody has done they a very serious the, job. They bring, out, they bring out a journal called Indian Journal of the History of I Science. I know, I know, I know. Which is a very useful journal. I have seen now, that journal, and I'm aware there are, of... there, are, there are certain ways in which you can reconstruct the history of science, material aspects. I'm concerned only with the material aspects. We need analytical laboratories for that, so that we can appreciate the science behind those objects. Kim I'm Plofka not... has written a uh, thing on Indian mathematics, Princeton University Press. Kim Plofka. Lots of people, lots Kim of people Plofka is a, she is a student of Pingri, who's a complete rascal. I have said it on record. He's a complete rascal, and I cannot accept anything that Kim Plofka says. Let us okay, talk let's, back. Let's, let's, let's talk now back. steer away. 
right? I'm, I'm so let's say not get that... into Tim Plopker and Pingree, David Pingree. They are just, just uh, you know, second-rate rascals. So we can oh. let them be honest historians first, you know. Let's have facts and then we can discuss how the facts are to be interpreted. If we don't accept, you know, some basic facts or don't contest them, neither digest nor contest, that I think is a big problem. And this does require some knowledge of uh, mathematics, of science, and we have not done anything. I mean, in D.P. Chattopadhyay's project, I was the one who was doing this in that Subbaratya chap. He doesn't have the courage to stand up and say anything. So I think that there has been so much of falsehood. We at least need somebody to talk about it, and we are not doing it. And I'm really, I've been trying this for 30 years since my first term at the Institute. I went to Sumit Sarkar and I told him, why don't you do history of science? And nobody did it. And <laughs> it is still not being done. And I'm amazed that the whole country was colonized on the basis of a false history of science, which we have not checked in, you know, one, when was my two hundred years. One history of scientists to appreciate the what? development of sciences. Right. So what? Sarkar can't do it. I can't do it. One I understand. I understand. I'm saying that we have not, after all, it is the history department which has to do some history of science. Not necessary. Every well, scientist separate. Separate so, history of science department. I know, I know they have given a PhD in history of science to a Bible scholar. And I have had a big contest with him in Malaysia. So I don't want to go into those issues. They understand the value. I'm only saying that our entire education system is based on the idea that science is something we developed in the West. All right, it's a completely false idea which we have never bothered to examine. So everything that Macaulay said, whether about astronomy or whether about anything else, was just false. And we can't just examine it after 200 years. I think it's a great shame on the civilization. And I think historians have something to do with it because historians want to make sure that their students get a job. And therefore, they make sure that, you know, history of science is nowhere in the picture. Let's put it like that. I came into it accidentally. Professor Raju, I shall give you yeah. a specific example. Now, that I suppose is a part of the history of science. Now, India has always had a glorious tradition of mining. There are extensive old mining areas in the country. Mm. See, for many years, I've been trying to get science people or mining people interested in the history of these mines. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. One or two people have published papers. That's a different thing. But otherwise, there has been no comprehensivity. On the other hand, yeah. organizations like Hindustan Copper Limited, Hindustan Zinc Limited, these people can easily get some people interested in the problem and come out with publications. Yeah. Easy, absolutely yeah. easy. Because methodologically, these are not insurmountable problems. You go through certain procedures, you collect data, you date them. It's basically, it will be cooperation between geologists, archaeologists, and proper metal people. After all these years, I mean, what can I say? Nobody's interested. Uh, mining. We are, great, we are great in discussion. No, no. Let's okay. talk of mining. <laughs> mining and the Ashok pillar. I had a friend in IIT Kanpur who was working on this, and he was looking at uh, the way the mines were done in. Uh, near uh, Bhopal in this, um, uh, what is that place, Vidisha, in Vidisha. However, mining is something subsidiary. Mathematics is something central. You no, can't do science without it. Different. You can't do science <laughs> without it. You can do science without, uh, you know, a particular type of steel, but you can't do science without mathematics. And we have completely neglected it. We think it's just about some, you know, some Vedic mathematics or this or that or some wild things. And the central things that have happened, for example, calculus. Calculus was stolen by Newton. And this is just a, it's a complete scandal. He didn't even understand what he was doing. And it was not understood in the West. It was not understood and it is still not understood. But the point is, at least a sort of discussion needs to be, needs to take place to bring out all these facts, which is not happening, somehow not happening at all. It's a very problematic thing, and I think historians have to contribute because historians, as he was saying, there is always politics, and there is a grant, and people want to grab the grant, and they say this should go to our person, and that should go to our person, and there is no space for anything else. 
that i think is the problem that is how historians are responsible and that is what i think they can do to correct Look, the historians are five seconds i don't like the historians but there is no way of saying that they are responsible because they don't professor, understand anything else right professor mukherjee just five seconds i just want to know from this august uh, audience the ramkrishna mission history of culture volume 6 i think is devoted to history of science and i know at least some of the historians some of the scientists who have contributed to this the physics chapter has been controlled professor a n mitra is a very yeah. learned very well known physicist i know that him very well yes by, mm. uh, so, so But, i don't know because i i know him they, so i think how is that how is that is not book? relevant it is not relevant because i was part of the project a phi species yes. project when an mitra and all these people came they take mm. up these issues only after retirement no fine that's after all... retirement <laughs> they will not that's, that's not a disqualification no, 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 i think i think the... i want no, to no. know quality of that thing no, quality it, is, of it is, is huh. See, i think i you... understand it the point that uh, professor uh, raju is making is that a systematic inclusion of the history of science has not been attempted by historians in india and that is a lacuna and you know a whole institution nistads was devoted to this they did produce some work maybe it's not satisfactory but the truth is professor raju this will only add to our litany of complaints which is fine we have no, no. already collected Let's, we have collected have so many complaints no Let's i agree i mean that, yes. you, you are the one to lead it and i even invited you yeah yeah to, to conduct a conference yeah. and uh, i mean it's a specialized topic and i mean it shouldn't become like a bug bear like everywhere you stand up and say the same thing because the the point is it's it's really it's a very important issue and uh, as i said it's a part of several other important issues in terms of you know how we do our history and i was just thinking when i was reading a little bit for this uh, conference that some of our best historians including jadunath sarkar were not historians they didn't have phd's they were not within quotes trained in history they were their, their disciplinary affiliations were something different and i think that the moment you started getting professional historians yeah and then yeah. the you know so these are the paradoxes and we have been yeah. outlining yeah. some of them you know Quite and, true. and especially after independence because till then there were people like rc mojumdar they were trained historians they produced remarkable histories you know india's impact or uh, you know the so called greater india history of champa northeast i think he's got also a book on metallurgy if i'm not mistaken or uh, is it of i can't remember exactly so all these things were completely you know forgotten uh, and uh, that uh, trend of uh, you know debunking and uh, in some ways destroying that edifice of so called nationalist history calling it communal and now they'll call it hindutva or something else and in the process and of course the we can we have conspiracy theories galore but ultimately i also agree that it's about jobs and tenure and all these people have made it all there's not a single major subaltern historian in india so so it became they're all tenured in america all of them or in the western world so it became a, a raft you know a school of history became a raft post colonialism was another raft so these were rafts to rescue and rehabilitate uh, you know the so called uh, third world intellectuals arif derlik had a wonderful paper where he said post colonialism begins when intellectuals from the colonies arrive in the first world you know so then then they they keep they keep doing this because it's self perpetuating and in india again it's about our jobs it's about who is who student and these departments of history with their inbreeding uh, etc so anyhow despite that i think let's conclude it's an exciting time there's a churn there are possibilities professor raju himself has written several books several articles and i'm sure in our indian tradition you have to find some chelas professor raju you have to find four or five people who will carry on the mashal 
the flame forward, the torch, and you you are a unique, uh, you know, polymath. You have to create chelas now. It's not enough for you to keep, uh, you know, going place to place and saying, excuse me, but what about this? What about that? I think you need a group. And again, unfortunately, some of this happens only within institutions. You know, but there are people who want to encourage a Gurukul type of uh, uh, situation in India. Maybe we can do something and four or five people can work with you, perhaps. But uh, otherwise, I think the universe in its wisdom, <laughs> because I think human agency is also limited and institutional agency is contaminated. And so I think we have to leave it at that and the discussion will continue. Tomorrow, I invite everyone to join us at 9 a.m. It may be a bit early, but uh, uh, I think if you want to listen to Professor Andre Wink uh, in the morning tomorrow, then please join us. And we will be, I think, ending before lunch with the final talk by Shonalika Kaul, who has done an excellent work on Raja Tarangini. In my chat box, one of our own former fellow said, well, Raja Tarangini is not history. So, you know, I wanted to say Herodotus, look at all the stuff he's written, all the mythical creatures and the uh, descriptions. So, indeed, before the 18th century, even in the West, uh, it was very difficult to have accounts which were shown off these fantastical, uh, you know, claims and information. And Macaulay uh, with the zeal of a neophyte could claim that Indians have no history because they have uh, yugas which go for thousands of years, lakhs of years, hundreds of thousands of years, seas of treacle. What he meant was, uh, I suppose, kshira sagar. He thought it was treacle, kheer. It's not treacle, it's dood, you know, kshira, which is in a way what gives Kashmir its name also. But uh, I think uh, on that note, uh, you know, unfortunately, many times we get together and we vent, but that's also a part of academic life in India because uh, I think Arnold Toynbee said that uh, the intelligentsia is always unhappy because, you know, it never fits in uh, to which, whichever system it finds itself in. And actually, some of the greatest work has been done by outliers. And this room is full of outliers. Uh, and uh, really, uh, congratulations to all the outliers, uh, Professor Chakrabarti, Professor Mukherjee, Professor C.K. Raju, uh, and of course, uh, Professor uh, Raghottam, who's left us, and all the other outliers of Indian history who have been plowing a lonely furrow all these years. And uh, somehow our intellectual enterprise continues. So till tomorrow, I thank all of you. And uh, good evening and namaste. Thank you Thank so you. much. Please, please join us tomorrow if you can. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.